Next, campaign finance reform. The House Oversight Committee holds its second hearing on this issue and looks at the role of political action committees in federal elections. The committee hopes to develop a reform proposal to send to the House for consideration. Witnesses today include several members of Congress and political action committee members and contributors. Congressman Bill Thomas chairs the hearing. Committee on House Oversight uh, will come to order. This is the uh, second hearing in a series of hearings on campaign finance reform. As you recall, at the first hearing, uh, the Speaker of the House and uh, the Minority Leader uh, both gave us a, a broad perspective of campaign finance, perhaps far broader than most people normally associate with campaign finance. They went to the heart of the political process and discussed power. I had said at the first hearing that a definition of politics that I think is very useful is an old one. It's the process of determining who gets what, when, and how. And power in that context is who are those who help determine who gets what, when, and how. And unfortunately, in this process, oftentimes, individuals or groups political power is enhanced if other individuals or groups political power is diminished it sometimes tends to be a relative power struggle when you look at uh, the period from the time the campaign uh, finance laws that are currently in effect were initially passed and amended it roughly corresponds to the period that the chairman and the ranking member from California have been actively involved in elective politics. Uh, we both were elected to the assembly in the state of California in the 1974-75 period. I preceded the gentleman by a matter of a few months. We both came to Congress at the same time. That was the period that the current campaign finance laws, as I said, were passed and put into shape. It also roughly corresponds with the era, if you will, sometimes called the PAC era, the growth of PACs. There's a chart over there, and I believe it's available to anyone who wants to look at it, which I think fairly graphically illustrates why you could rightfully identify the period from the 1970s to today as the period of the growth of PACs. PACs, as we heard uh, in uh, earlier testimony, and I'm sure we'll hear today, have been around for a long time, oftentimes focused on one of the original political action committees, the Committee on Political Education, or COPE of the FFL-CIO. But it wasn't until the 1970s, with legislation, court decisions, and subsequent decisions by the Federal Election Commission, that you got this enormous growth of PACs. Beginning, as you can see, uh, in the early 70s with less than 1,000 and peaking out at around 4,000. Hasn't been a continuous growth of new PACs. There have been ebbing and flowing, but clearly a continuation in the number. The chart itself shows the dollar amounts contributed by the political action committees. It's interesting, if you take the number of PACs and the dollar amounts that are contributed and simply divide one into the other, which would give you the average dollars contributed per pack. If you look at the 1974 period, the average amount is $57,000. These are figures not adjusted for inflation. If you look at the 1994 number of packs and dollar amounts contributed, it turns out to be $45,000. 1974, average PAC gave $57,000. Not adjusted for inflation in 1994, the average PAC contribution was $45,000. Most of the focus 
has been on what happens in terms of elections, the impact of PACs in electing people to office. At the same time you had the growth of the PAC era, you had legislation passed which redefined political parties. When PACs were going from 600 to over 4,000, you had two major political parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. That same 1970s legislation limited with minor inflationary adjustments the amount that the two parties and other minor parties could contribute to the political process. A multiplication of the number of PACs, a natural, in essence, political limitation on the number of political parties. At the same time, in the 1970s, the legislation capped the amount of money that individuals could contribute. $1,000 in the 1970s, $1,000 today. Today's $1,000 is roughly equivalent to about $325. But when you listen to the debate over PACs, and I'm going to let the witnesses talk about what they like or dislike about PACs, and that's the purpose of today's hearings, it basically runs the gamut that PACs as a concept will destroy American democracy as we know it. Two, PACs are the very epitome of the American democratic process. And I think it has to do with the perspective from which you view power. If politics is who gets what, when and how, where are you relative to others? When you talk about campaigns and you look at PACs, the immediate association is with incumbents. Indeed, as the speaker said, uh, it's been a slightly different world since uh, Republicans have become a majority because PACs, in fact, are interested in the decision-making process, not so much in who makes those decisions. And so naturally, since incumbents are already in, the argument is that the PAC dollars flow to incumbents. Uh, a better way of looking at that chart, because when you look at it initially, you see bars. When you do it in a line graph, I think it becomes far more interesting. The solid line is a representation of the bar graph over the same period of the amount of money contributed by PACs to incumbents. The broken line is the amount of money contributed to incumbents by individuals. For those who might argue that we are in, in an era of ever-increasing control going to the PACs, if in fact contributions of money is defined as power, I think you've seen a period in which PACs perhaps had the upper hand, but that obviously in the flow of money, it's changing. And this is to incumbents. When you examine it in the larger context of all candidates, both incumbents and non-incumbents, you get a chart that looks like that. And once again, when you see bar charts like that, you look at it, you react to the numbers, and you say, okay. But when you turn it into a line graph, I think it does give you a better perspective on the political process. This is all candidates, both incumbents and non-incumbents, and contributions. The solid line are political action committees. The broken line are individuals. And indeed, there was a period where you saw PACs moving in the direction of being the primary contributors to the political process. That is a historical period. And the trend lines, if you carry them out, will continue to move us away from that historical period. The question is, notwithstanding the ebb and flow of political dollars, notwithstanding the absolute limit, both legislatively and politically, on the number of political parties. And the reason is, of course, it's a mutually exclusive game with political parties. You either belong to the Democratic Party or you belong to the Republican Party. You can't belong to both. And as you multiply parties in our system, there is a natural structure which compresses them back to the two major parties. And if you look at the history of political parties in our country, it hasn't always been the same two 
but for a long time, and for reasons perhaps we'll examine in later hearings, focusing on political parties, there are trends and structures in the system which I think will basically define uh, the two political parties for a long time. And when you look at during that same period, the amount that individuals can contribute has been capped. The growth of PACs has been primarily over the multiplication of the number of PACs. And that clearly we've seen the beginning of the tip, that is probably as many PACs as probably are going to be formed are formed. And with that as simply a factual background of the recent period known as the rise of PACs and the dollar amounts associated with PACs, I would yield to my friend and colleague, the gentleman from California. First of all, Mr. Chairman, I want to uh, tell you how much I enjoy Professor Thomas's tutorial. They are enlightening and uh, I think uh, legitimately break through a lot of the uh, rather simplistic nostrums that float around as it relates to what is wrong with the system and how we might fix it. Uh, I simply uh, would want to underscore the point that individual money, however it may be perceived to be free of special interest bias, in my experience, is far from that. It doesn't mean that there aren't a lot of people who give simply out of party loyalty or ideological commitment, but as you go up the scale of dollars from 25 to 250 to uh, 2,000 per primary and general per family, you find increasing interests that really coalie more with PAC giving than they do with the tradition of civic virtue and support for political campaigns. So I, I hope as we enter into the fray of campaign finance reform, and this our second hearing, we are all willing to, for just a moment, abandon some of our firmest positions and try to understand the environment we're truly in. As was said at the first set of hearings, there are problems with the political system, not just the campaign finance system. And while I think we are generally in agreement that there are problems, the degree to which we share uh, commonality of solution has uh, obviously eluded Congress and I think general opinion. So I simply would uh, thank the chairman once again for uh, convening these hearings. I think today we move not only to hear the diversity of views from our colleagues, but we move on to hear from people active in the political environment, uh, both professionally and uh, in terms of their citizen participation. And it will help us to understand the complexity of the problem and some of the pluses and minuses of the various solutions that have been offered. And I truly believe that if we are honest and thorough in who presents information to this committee, it will help us come up with something that might be conducive to bipartisan, at least broad, political acceptance. And I thank the chairman. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Um, actually, the first panel today is, and I don't mean this in any uh, derogatory way, is in part a spillover from uh, the, the first uh, uh, hearing because it was uh, hearing from members of Congress uh, having gone through the process and their view on the way in which uh, the process might be uh, modified. Uh, it's also, I think, um, uh, useful for us to start today's uh, hearing off with uh, what I think is a relatively representative smorgasbord uh, of approaches uh, to the questions of PACs. And so, uh, if you'll allow me, gentlemen, we'll begin on my right, uh, your left, first with the gentlewoman uh, from uh, New York, uh, Ms. Maloney. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for calling this hearing. And I, I would likewise like to thank my good friend, um, Mr. Fazia. Uh, first of all, I am not new to, to uh, the issue of campaign finance reform. As a member of the New York City Council, I authored the campaign finance law, which was called by the New York Public Interest uh, Group the best and finest and toughest in the nation. In my freshman year on the 103rd Congress, I served as co-chair of the Freshman Task Force on Campaign Finance on Congressman Gephardt's uh, Task Force on Campaign Finance, which authored and passed H.R. 3. And I am currently working with Congressman Fazio on a Democratic Task Force for Campaign Finance Reform. First of all, I'd like to address the, the idea of establishing an independent commission to write campaign finance reform legislation. I support this idea. 
And I, in fact, introduced a bill in, in March of, of, of one of this, um, of 1994, calling for an independent commission. I, you have before you a uh, packet of material that includes a letter from the president endorsing uh, the concept and uh, mentioning my bill. And uh, this bill was patterned after the base closing commission bill and a problem very similar to campaign finance. We all agreed that something had to be done. We couldn't agree on how to do it. And if Congressman Army never does another thing, he, con he contributed a great deal towards solving a problem in this nation by putting forward the commission idea. Um, it is outlined the specifics of it. In short, it would come back to the House for an up or down vote, and we would have a vote and, and move forward, hopefully, on campaign finance. I differ with the um, speaker's suggestion that it need a two-thirds uh, majority. I think it should have a simple majority like Congressman Army's uh, bill. One of the problems with campaign finance is that it will literally make it more difficult for incumbents to be reelected. Therefore, it's very difficult to, to have incumbents vote on a bill and put forward a measure. But presently, it appears that there is not a great deal of support for a commission idea. Um, several other bills have been put forward. The Smith, Me, and Shays bill uh, is a very solid and thoughtful proposal. And Congressman Farr has put forward the so-called Gageson bill, uh, which has uh, a great deal of support and has passed this body many times. I am working on my own proposal and would like to testify about certain ideas in my proposal that differ uh, from other legislation that uh, is being considered. First of all, since what we want to do is limit the influence of special interest and money in the political process, I propose that we confront Buckley versus Vallejo head on and put forward a bill that has a spending limit of 600000 per election cycle and let the courts decide if they decide that, it, that it's unconstitutional to have a spending limit, then fall back to a, uh, a uh, voluntary spending limit. But that decision is two decades old, and things have changed dramatically. Many constitutional scholars believe that a, a spending limit would, would win if we were to get to the Supreme Court with one. Um, in the Buckley versus Vallejo decision, they said that all meaningful political communication must be paid for. It did not take into account free media or the tremendous influence of independent uh, expenditures that in many cases decide elections. Uh, the court said that independent expenditures don't have, don't work if they are not connected to campaigns. We all know that that's not true. There are many examples, the Willie Horton and many others, that in some cases the independent expenditures have decided elections. So I think that it's time that if what we want to do is to influence the, uh, the amount of money in the political process, let's confront Buckley versus Vallejo, let's go to the Supreme Court. Uh, as Speaker Steingut from uh, the New York State Assembly used to say, decide what you think is right and then let the courts decide. So let's do that. But what we're addressing today is PACs. And I'd like to talk about that. Um, uh, and I have my own proposal of how the PACs should be reformed. Some say that PACs are the bad guys. I say that money is. Uh, money is money, whether it's in a PAC or from an individual. And if I could use the example of my own campaign, um, I raised a million dollars, my opponent raised a million dollars. I um, accepted PAC contributions, my opponent did not. My opponent uh, severely criticized me for accepting PAC contributions uh, from unions, yet he would accept a corporate check from the same entity. So I ask you, why is an executive's check more meaningful than a number of union workers who come together, pull their resources, and make a contribution? Another uh, graphic example is um, law firms. He uh, attacked me for taking a contribution from a, a PAC in a law firm. Yet from, the, from other law firms, he would go to them and, and literally get uh, $20,000 in individual uh, contributions. So I suggest that we have a $500 limit per election um, for both PACs, individual, for, 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 for uh, large PACs and for individual PACs. And I'm proposing that we create a new type of PAC, a citizen committee of small donors 
that uh, would contribute uh, $25 or less and that this small donor or citizen committee PAC could contribute up to 1000 per election. Um, I also feel that uh, you need to be able to lift the spending limit, the voluntary spending limit, if your opponent does not opt in in order to level the playing field. Um, I feel Tell also... Gentlewoman, your mm -hmm. time has expired, but you can go ahead and, and wrap it up. It's just that if we have an unlimited time for each member, uh, Vic and I are going to get old here. Well, I would like to so uh, go ahead submit and, my... Uh, and, no, no, you can go ahead and focus mm -hmm. on the key points. I just want to... Basically, I'm telling the other members that since you went first, you got mm -hmm. the privilege. Of okay, I, I also think forward. that we should ban contributions um, from current lobbyists and, and uh, limit contributions from individuals to 75% in state. I'd like to, to close very briefly... Uh, with a statement from one of my constituents this past uh, weekend. I was at a meeting of business leaders in my district and one executive questioned whether campaign finance reform was really a serious concern of the American people. He insisted that reducing taxes was far more important to this particular group of people. But the way campaigns are financed has a lot to do with reducing taxes. The American taxpayer will have to cough up half a trillion dollars for the SNL bailout. The SNL crisis was caused by reckless deregulation of the SNLs adopted by many members of Congress whose campaigns were financed by SNLs. Now the American taxpayer is picking up the whopping tab. Last fall, the voters issued a mandate for change, a mandate for us in Congress to do more than protect our chances for re-election. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope they did not vote in vain and that you will move forward with a bipartisan campaign finance law. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. And I would ask members if uh, we could go through the panel without asking questions so that we could get a general response since you have different uh, particulars. I know that your time is precious, but it would be very helpful to us if we could do that. I would next recognize my friend and a colleague from the Ways and Means Committee, the gentleman uh, from Georgia, Mr. Lewis. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and my colleague, mm -hmm. Mr. Faiso, for the opportunity to come before you today. The challenge and task that you are undertaking is formidable. Changing the way congressional campaigns are financed is a difficult job, particularly because it is something that will dramatically impact all of our lives. But clearly, something must be done. Too much time is spent raising money, and the current system is one that has fueled public cynicism about the way our democracy works. I commend you for holding these hearings and I'm hopeful that you can arrive at a formula which is fair, nonpartisan, and non-discriminatory and restore the American people's faith in our democracy. In 1986, when I first decided to leave the Atlanta City Council and seek the open seat in Georgia's 5th Congressional District, I was a grassroots candidate. My background had been in the Civil Rights Movement and my energy on the City Council had been devoted to issues relating to low-income housing, neighborhood preservation, and homelessness. I didn't have a lot of supporters who were able to write my campaign checks for $1,000. Faced with formidable opposition in the race, it was only with the support of Labor and Union Political Action Committee and a few others that I was able to mount a credible and ultimately successful bid for the Congress. If not for the support of these, quote, special interests, unquote, this former civil rights worker, this quote son of a sharecropper, would not have had a prayer to make it to the United States House of Representatives. Thus have been surprised and dismayed in recent years to see political action committees on a such vitriolic attack from so many different quarters including many of my friends in the public interest community. Political action committees, especially those of labor unions and other logical groups, like those supporting or opposing abortion rights, gay rights, or gun control, give working people and people with little means the ability to participate in the political process. Many of these people who contribute through a check off or small deduction from their paycheck each week would effectively be denied participation in the process if not for their union or company political action committee. <clears throat> Let there be no confusion. 
minority women candidates from poor, rural, and urban districts are the beneficiary of political action committees. PACs take power and influence out of the hand of the country club set and put it in the hand of the people who cannot afford to write $500 or $1,000 checks. This is one of the reasons political action committees were established, and this is exactly why PACs should be protected in any campaign reform finance legislation. To do otherwise is to revert to the system controlled by the wealthy individual and the millionaire candidates who bankrolls their own campaign. I know there were those who believed that this was a position taken by Democrats at a time when they controlled the House and were the beneficiary of the majority of political action contribution. Let me assure my colleagues that even in light of my party new minority status in this House, even in light of the fight that a majority of PIKE funds are now flowing into Republic, Republican coffers, I'm still supportive and very supportive of political action committee and their rights to participate in the political process. I know there are various proposals before this committee not to reduce or lower PIKE's contribution or eliminate them altogether. Such a move should be resisted. Federal election law today permit candidates to accept contribution of $5,000 in the primary and $5,000 in the general election. A reduction in the contribution limit would have a minimal impact on overall contributions and would have a disproportionate impact on minority candidates. I believe, as been noted before this committee, that the individual limit of $1,000 per person per election adopted in 1974 is worth only about $325 today when adjusted for inflation. Similarly, the $5,000 per election limit when adjusted is worth about $1,625. Inflation with no adjustment to compensate for it have been the effect of lowering the individual and political action committee contribution limit year after year. A 1994 common call study showed that lowering the political action committee contribution limits will cost candidates in competitive races 3 percent of their PACs contribution. Calculations using the same numbers show that a reduction in the limit will cost members of the Congressional Black Caucus more than twice that amount. Minority candidates have worked too hard and too long to gain equal footing in the political system. CBC and other minority candidates should not be discriminated against in any campaign finance formula. Indeed, Mr. Chairman, traditionally one of the goals of reform has been to open the political process, not to throw, out, throw up roadblocks to minority participation. I believe that Congress should pass a strong campaign finance reform bill this year but it cannot be considered true reform if it narrows the scope of who can participate and who can contribute in our political system. Minority and women have waited far too long to have a voice in the Congress. We cannot impede their gains by jeopardizing their future. To ensure that this is a fair process for all, we should not, this committee should not, lower the PACs limit or eliminate PACs. Mr. Chairman, PACs are people too. Let's not pick on PACs. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Faiso. Thank you very much, Mr. Lewis. Uh, General from Illinois, Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas and Ranking Member Mr. Fazio. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to share my ideas with you. Mr. Chairman, these are important hearings and your decision to open up your committee room to those of us interested in this matter takes us a major step toward the day when the public feels confident that all the rooms of Congress are open to all Americans who have an issue to bring before their representatives. Let's face it, at this point, whether it's based on perception or reality or a combination of both, many Americans believe that access to their elected officials is often determined by relationships cultivated during campaign season, particularly during the fundraising stage of a campaign. And why is that the case? Because of the flawed campaign finance system that places too high a premium on raising and spending excessive funds. I hope that I can offer one possible solution today. I've drafted a bill and it's available in discussion form um, 
for anyone who wishes to see the uh, legislative language that would decrease candidates' dependence on raising huge sums of money while enhancing the ability of all Americans to participate in all elements of the political process. How do we reach that goal? Well, for starters, I would recommend that we make better use of a mechanism that so many people seem intent on discarding altogether, the Political Action Committee. Now, I know it's popular to bash PACs, and I agree that they often hold too much sway over candidates. However, before we throw them out, let's think about whether PACs in a reform version can be used to cure some of the rest of the system. I believe they can, and let me explain. My bill would establish something I like to call the PACs tax, a pool of money we create by penalizing or taxing certain entities like PACs, wealthy candidates, bundlers, leadership committees, when they spend at excessive levels. My proposal sets up a voluntary limit of $1,000 in contributions per candidate from a single PAC during an election. Keep in mind, this does not replace or revoke the current hard ceiling of $5,000 that a PAC can give to a single candidate. That would remain intact. However, under my plan, if a PAC chooses to give more than $1,000 to a candidate, a penalty, that is a PAC's tax, is then imposed. The resulting money would then be collected in a pool, which I like to call the electoral, electoral Equity Fund, that would be administered by the Federal Election Commission. Next, the money would then be available to candidates who agrees to spend less than $600,000. He or she would be eligible to get up to one-third of his or her money from the PACS tax pool. To encourage low dollar contributions, the candidate would only receive a reimbursement equal to the amount that was raised in individual contributions of $200 or less. Now, th despite the name PACS tax, I would, like, I would hope we could s use it to target other sources whose influence should be decreased on leadership PACS, on bundlers, on wealthy candidates who spend size, who spend sizable personal fortunes to win a House seat. They would be, under my proposal, allowed to spend $50,000 of their own money before the penalty kicks in. Any campaign that spends $1 million would also be penalized. The rate of the penalty would be 39.6%. That's the highest rate of corporate taxation. Any money raised or spent above the suggested limits would be subject to the tax. For example, Let's say a PAX maxes out, that is, gives $5,000 to a single candidate. In that case, the PAC would owe a penalty of about $1,584. In other words, 39.6% of the $4,000 on that contribution. Or let's say a campaign spends $1.1 million. The campaign would face a $39,600 tax. My, Mr. Chairman, let me anticipate some of the concerns that you and others may raise. First of all, I'm willing to concede that our bill contains a big loophole. And to be honest, I'm kind of proud of this loophole. I think it's a good sign. The loophole is this. It is possible, it's easy for a PAC, a campaign, or a wealthy candidate to avoid paying any penalty or tax. All they have to do is lower spending voluntarily. Either way, I believe we've accomplished our goal. Either PAC directors decide to limit their contributions in order to avoid the tax, or we will be able, or we will be able to level the playing field thanks to the money that's generated by penalizing the excessive spending. I think it's a win-win situation. Now let me also point out that I recognize that this bill presents some relevant legal questions. Namely, is it constitutional to impose a penalty on political contributions? I would prefer to leave this issue to legal scholars. However, I would at least argue if this constitutional question is applicable to my bill, then it should certainly be raised in connection with those proposals to seek to ban PACs altogether. I would also argue that my bill is in keeping with the body of legal precedent surrounding this issue because I see my bill as creating incentives to abide by the limits rather than by simply creating penalties for those who break them. The candidate has the incentive to spend less to accept lower dollar contributions. Clearly, this is a real hunger in America for political reform. And I think that this is a proposal that might just achieve that. It means that we must do more than simply keep what works or throw away what doesn't. 
It requires us to take the best elements of the current system, revise them, reform them in a way that helps us reach our goal of creating a political system that creates greater contact between all candidates and constituents. I think my proposal has some merits, and I'd love to discuss it with you and others. Thank you so much this morning. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we have a vote on on the floor. Uh, and unfortunately, we're going to have to go over and come back. And so the committee will stand in recess until 11 o'clock. Jennifer, have you voted? Did you vote? reconvene um, and now it's our pleasure to hear from uh, a member of the large freshman class about campaign finance reform the gentleman from Washington mr. White thank you very much mr. chairman and I thank the ranking member uh, you're very kind to allow me a little time to talk to you today and I do have a written statement that I've submitted for the record but what I'd like to do say at this point that if any of the other members have written statements without objection they'll be made a part of the record I thank you very much mr. chairman um, first of all, I'd like to say, and this isn't in my written statement, but I'm here with a great deal of humility this morning. I recognize that this committee, and the chairman in particular, has been at the forefront of efforts to reform the campaign finance laws, uh, to reform the franking laws, and remember the, many of the other uh, problems we have in our political system that really need to be addressed. Personally, I'm new to politics. This is my first elected office. I'd never run for office before uh, running for this uh, office in 1994, so I really do come before this committee with some humility. Having said that, I think being new, I also bring a perspective that probably is uh, useful in this proceeding, and I'd like to just spend a minute or two talking about my recent race, um, because at least for me it sheds some light on, on what's wrong with our current system. As I mentioned, I'd never run for office before, uh, and I can remember the day very clearly. It was Thanksgiving Day, 1992, when I sat down with my dad after a nice Thanksgiving dinner, maybe we'd have a little bit too much wine with our turkey, and told him that I was thinking about running for Congress. And uh, as we went through the process and tried to figure out what we'd have to do, we realized that we'd probably have to raise about $500,000 to have a credible campaign. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we would do that. Ultimately, we decided, like most people do, that we'd have to start with the people who knew me the best, my family and friends. And that's exactly what we did. I raised money from my dad, from my Aunt Wanda, from my Uncle Brooks, from the guy down the street at the grocery store, from everybody who knew me the best. And slowly but surely, we accumulated a little bit of a campaign treasury. I also tried to raise some money from PACs. And I can tell you, we tried as hard as we could to get their attention uh, and didn't have much success. Ultimately, in the campaign, we raised about $550,000 during the election cycle. $40,000 of that came from PACs. The rest was from individuals. Now, I was running against an incumbent. And by contrast, I raised about $550,000 overall, including $40,000 from PACs. My opponent raised about $500,000 from PACs alone. And we did a little analysis of the uh, PAC contributions after the campaign. And we realized that my $40,000 came primarily from the PAC at my own law firm, my dad's company's PAC, uh, the PAC of uh, a friend of the family who had uh, been the best man at my wedding, uh, those sorts of connections. With very few exceptions, did any PAC that I didn't have a personal relationship with contribute to my campaign. By contrast, my opponent had maximum contributions at the $10,000 level from at least 15 labor organizations. That's $150,000 just right out of the box, and a number of uh, major contributions from PACs all around the country for a total of about $500,000. Now, the conclusion I drew from this, Mr. Chairman, and I recognize this is only one example, but the conclusion I drew and I draw today is that PACs are vastly skewed in favor of the incumbent. Uh, at least in my case, that turned out to be true. Uh, and having said that, as I sat down to think about the campaign finance reform system, I really concluded that every part of the campaign finance system is essentially skewed in favor of the incumbent. And I've, I've come to believe that everything this House has done in the past is like, has been 
uh, skewed in favor of the incumbent. And just about everything we can expect this House reasonably to do the, in, in the future will probably be biased in favor of the incumbent. It's really just asking a little bit too much, I think, of ourselves to impose upon ourselves restrictions that are going to allow challengers a better chance of beating us. And so the conclusion I came up with um, was that the only way we're ever going to solve this problem and make sure that challengers have an equal chance is to come up with something like a commission that will look at the, at the uh, system in an unbiased way and propose something for an up or down vote. So on Tuesday of this week, I introduced H.R. 2635, the Fair Elections Act, which would call for a commission similar to the Base Closure Commission. It's a 12-member commission for Republicans, for Democrats, for Independents. It has 90 days to come up with a plan. Congress has to vote on the plan within 30 days after it's been proposed. It has only three goals, only three uh, directions in my bill that are given to this committee. Number one, come up with a system that allows for fair and meaningful elections. Number two, try to eliminate the influence of special interest money on the outcome of elections. And number three, try to design a system that doesn't give incumbents an unfair advantage. It's a straight from the shoulder, simple and fair approach to trying to come up with a campaign finance system that really works for both challengers and incumbents. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I don't know what this commission would do with PACs. It might decide to expand their role. It might decide to limit their role. But I do know that about the only way we're going to end up with a fair campaign finance system is to let somebody other than Congress make the initial decision. And I hope the, uh, this committee will take that into consideration as it uh, moves through its work. Once again, I congratulate the chairman of this committee. You're doing a great job. And uh, I hope we come to a very successful conclusion. Thank you for letting me testify. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Uh, next member to testify before us uh, in this area of difficult decision making uh, comes from hopefully an optimistic location, uh, Hope, Arkansas. Gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Dickey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My experience is this. I, I've had two elections, and I have not taken PAC money at all. And I think because of that, I can speak about some things that other people can, in fact, only look at and not, and not, actually, and not feel. What happens is that when a person doesn't take PACs, they identify more with the people who are on the lower end of the economy the lower end of the income stream. And what those folks are saying is that we, we don't have any access to this system because you all are deciding all that according to how much money is given and who's given it, and, and the PACs are the ones that are leading the, leading the way. I think we need to somehow remember that if we can eliminate PACs giving money, that we will bring those people into the system where they will feel more like it's, there's a good reason to vote, more like uh, giving $10 or $25 or, or, or even $5, as in some cases I, I, I receive. And I think it's, it's something we ought, to, we ought to seriously consider as we move through this. They think that the sole ticket to participation in politics is money. It would, if we eliminated that, it would be awfully good. The other thing that the, the, that the people like who are on the lower end of this, on the scale of the economy, is that candidates have to approach them, that they really need them, that they come and they, they do it through mailings, as I, as I do, and through, and through solicitations, and even sometimes in, in advertisements in newspapers. That so we're saying we want the little contribution. Right now I'm working on a project called Project 39, where we're asking for people to give no more or no less than $39. And it's the sort of thing that I, I believe is necessary in the whole scheme of things to keep our system strong because we need those people and we need to let them know about it. I thought that, that when, I, when I fought the PACs like Rick did uh, in my elections, I thought it was a philosophical conviction that was leading the people to, to the, the PACs to decide to support my opponent. I really did. I, I thought, well, this is the sort of thing that we have a difference. And I was, I was out pitching the, the, the theme about being a conservative and we have, to spend, we have to save money and so forth. And then all of a sudden, the first three months of this year came and I saw this money coming over, flowing over from the Democrats to the Republicans and I got a cheap feeling. 
I got a feeling like it's really, it really is going to be true. Those people down there at the lower end of the, of the, of the e economy and the, and the stream of income are going to say, yes, see, that is exactly what's happening. It's not a philosophical conviction. It's not someone who's saying through the PACs, this is our expression of, of, of our opinion about how you're doing. It is power. It is control. And it is a majority rule in, in, in Congress. And again, as we look at it from the standpoint of that, of that lowly person who's saying, I have a choice to, to just get out of this. I don't have to register. I don't have to vote. I don't have to do anything. I can't afford to give to PACs. I'm just going to opt out. Now, I'm saying if, if, we, if we continue like we're going and we're watching these examples take place, then we, we can't deny it. We, we get to the point where we just actually can't deny it. I know this, that in my elections, I have the freedom to say that there wasn't any PAC that I owed my election to. I heard Representative Lewis say I couldn't do it without it. I don't believe that's the case. Representative Lewis actually came into my district and campaigned against me. I know how forceful he is. You understand? And I'm just saying he could have done it by himself. But if he had of it and he didn't know it to the PACs and he had said, I'm relying on the people, just think about the, the constructiveness. Of that, of, that, of that experience. And I think he's, we're deprived of it because we don't do it. PACs are needed. I want to say that for sure. We need the advocacy of PACs. We need people who are coming in who are squares, not well-rounded in information, but just squares, and say, look, we don't know about all these other issues, but we know about this one, and this is how this is unfair, and this is how our, our position is needed. But we need for our influence to be through information and not money. The influence of the PACs needs to be through information and through working hard, not through money. You see what we're doing by promoting the PACs and by promoting the lobbyists and so forth, we're asking them to hire people who are experts and skillful in manipulation. And, and what, what happens is they want to manipulate us and they want to buy influence. Other, other than that, we wouldn't have this great swing over to the Republicans with this PAC money, millions of dollars. And don't think those eyes aren't watching us that make up the strength of this nation, the small, middle-class individual. Now, I think it's, it's, it's essential that we pay attention to them and that we say no to the PAC money being given and that way free them to be a part of strengthening our system rather than destroying it with this PAC money going for access and for influence and blatantly saying, we expect something from you because you, we have given you this money or we're going to withhold it next time and you'll never get reelected. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Our uh, last witness, uh, gentleman who, uh, as, uh, as much as anybody I've, I've ever known, actually practices what he preaches. Uh, the giant killer from the Eastern Shore, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you just need a sling and a rock. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be relatively brief. Um, I want to just take a few seconds to give a little boring background, which um, led me to this place, the U.S. Congress. Everybody, 435 members of Congress, have fascinating stories to tell as to the road they took to get here. In 1986, I decided to quit my job as a school teacher and go live in the wilderness in the northern Rocky Mountains. About a year later, I broke my jaw in a horse accident, came back unemployed, started painting houses to, to keep uh, the family together, decided it would be interesting to run for Congress while I was painting houses. I ran in 1988 against uh, an incumbent and got 49.6% of the vote. The primary election uh, against another Republican, I won with $300. The um, incumbent spent about $800,000. I spent $100,000 um, and was pretty close. Certainly raised my status. 1990, I won with 57% of the vote, still outspent about 8 to 1 in the second election. 1992, I ran against another incumbent who was pretty good at basketball. He spent about $1,600,000. We spent about $300,000. We did take a little PAC money, but it was probably about 20 to 25 percent of the total cost of, of, of the campaign. Now, what I would like to, and, and I'm not an evangelical preacher of campaign finance reform, but in an ideal world, I suppose, from my perspective, it would be positive to do the following. Uh, take no money from anybody unless they can vote for you. No, I didn't create that idea. Campaigning in 1988, I ran across a carpenter 
uh, going from door to door, shopping plaza to shopping plaza, supermarket to supermarket. I ran across a carpenter who was sitting down eating lunch on a bench near a park, and I introduced myself, and I said, um, you know, talk a little bit about Congress and so on, and he said, I haven't voted since the Eisenhower days, and I said, why not? And he says, because money is the poison that has uh, caused a problem in the political arena, and until that's changed, I won't participate. And I said, what would you do? And he said, uh, the law should be that no one can give you money unless they can vote for you. Now, I know this is sort of extreme, but like some of the other members that are testifying, I did it, I tried it. What I think it has done is caused a number of things to happen. Number one, you better go out there and find people that are going to support you. Now, I didn't go to my family and ask them for money. I said, I'm going to run for Congress. Can you help me pass out flyers? Now, they gradually gave me a few bucks, but I didn't go to the family or friends. I didn't even go to my friends first because I was embarrassed to ask them for money unless I was going to paint their window or, or cut their grass or something. Uh, but, but it is a group of people that, that recognize that you have something to contribute. So they surround you. They encourage you. You begin the process of raising a few funds. You get a little bit of credibility. You have a message. But the point is you work very hard and you're dedicated to a position and people begin to recognize that. Now I know some of the people up here probably testified earlier about public financing and I know to a large extent people feel that that is a perspective that would level the playing field. One of the reasons I don't th two reasons I don't think we should have public financing. Number one, if you're out there and you're an individual and you have the courage or the tenacity or the insanity to run for Congress, you have to spend a lot of time strategizing how you're going to do it and what your message is. I would think if you're going to get $60,000, $100,000 from taxpayers' money, balancing out what you raise, you're going to count on that instead of going to another shopping plaza, going to another group of uh, voters to talk to them, or raising some money in an ingenious way. It sort of takes away from the creativity. The other thing is the perception of it to the public is we're trying to balance the budget. We're, we're reducing federal spending, and I just think across the board, if people felt that their tax dollars were going to somebody that decided they want to run for Congress is not the thing we want to do at this particular time. So we have dropped uh, the Voter Empowerment uh, Act, and we feel that, I feel, and we've done it uh, several times now, it would be interesting if we pass the law that you can't take money from anybody unless they can vote for you. That, uh, and I know there's some constitutional questions involved in that. But I, I, I do think, like the members have testified here, that uh, we need to do something um, for the perception of money in politics. And then we need to do something to actually clean up uh, the system so that everybody has a fair playing field. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And I want to thank um, all of the panelists, uh, not just for your uh, testimony in diverse positions, but for your willingness uh, to return after you uh, testified. Uh, to uh, begin the series of questions of the members, I would like to call on the gentlewoman from Washington who, uh, prior to becoming a member of Congress, was in fact a chairman of a political party in the state of Washington and has been involved in this area for a long time, has her own perspectives, uh, and will be a major contributor as we go forward in this process. Gentlewoman from Washington. I thank the chairman and thank all of you who came to testify. This has been a wonderful series uh, of panels uh, to discuss a very broad area of campaign finance reform. I am a supporter of those who believe we've got to look deeply into each one of these issues so that we can put the package together that is well integrated. And PACs are simply one portion of that package. I suspect some of you on the panel would like to be addressing other parts of the issues. And as we go through these hearings between now and May, I hope you will feel comfortable to return and, and help us out with some of the other areas. My sense, uh, as I have dealt with this issue for many years, as a party chairman who helped other people collect money, be elected to office, as I dealt with interest groups and as I dealt uh, from the position of a candidate, is that what we want to do is create uh, a, a scenario that allows competitiveness that allows the challenger to step into the ring and be able to, to work against an incumbent who is usually very, very well financed uh, for a number of reasons, uh, who is able to get his or her message out to the people in an effective way, uh, not necessarily through the choice words of the media, and uh, is able to present his or her point of view on issues in order to inform the public. 
So uh, I, I think when it comes to PACs, I am not one who would outlaw PACs. I don't think that's uh, the right way to go. Um, I want to take a very deliberative look at this whole thing. And, and uh, I, I'm going to spend the rest of my time, Mr. Chairman, with, uh, with Mr. White since he's from my home state. And I recall on election night uh, standing next to him as we watched the returns. He had run against a well-financed incumbent, a, uh, a colleague of Ms. Maloney, came at the same time she did, who was very much a, a favorite of the Speaker of the House, well-funded. And um, <clears throat> I really want to get to the core of this. Uh, Rick, tell us uh, in your campaign how PAC money affected your race. Uh, do you feel uh, at this point that you are selling your vote to an interest group that has helped to elect you to office? And uh, do you believe that there should be some influence cast by uh, folks who belong to interest groups who live outside your congressional district? Well, Jennifer, number one, let me say thank you very much for your kind words and for all the help uh, you've given me and also for being a leader on this issue. Um, and, but I would say if there's an interest group that I feel beholden to at the present time, it's basically my Aunt Wanda. I mean, that's where my initial campaign contributions came from, from my family and my friends. Uh, uh, and uh, she does not have a PAC, but she's been very supportive. And, and that's the way my campaign had to start. As I mentioned earlier in my uh, testimony, we ended up the campaign begging, pleading, doing everything we possibly could to raise $40,000 in PAC money. My opponent uh, seemed to have no trouble whatsoever raising $500,000 in PAC money, almost the total amount that I raised during that period of time. And so my conclusion was that, uh, at least in my case, the PAC contributions uh, worked very much in favor of the incumbent. And uh, uh, whether there are people feel beholden to them or not, I don't know. But uh, I do think that the main problem I saw is that they favor the person who's already in office. Uh, since I still have a little time left, I wanted to ask a question of Mr. Gil Gilchrist. Um, Wayne, you've got a unique situation, and talk about a, uh, a member with lots of different uh, backgrounds and, and great interest to all of us, somebody that we've enjoyed so much working with here in the Congress. Um, what I really want to get at, Wayne, um, you didn't take PAC money, you didn't take contributions from people outside the district. Uh, was this because the incumbent was very unpopular? What I want to know is how did you get your message across to people and what can you do if you limit or equalize PAC contributions to what an individual could give? Um, how do you get the message out as a challenger? Is it impossible? Does it depend on a district where the incumbent is weak or do you believe truly uh, that we can do this considering all the advantages that an incumbent automatically has outside the realm of PAC contributions? Um, those are good qu questions, Jennifer. The, um, both incumbents had, um, whether it was uh, Mr. Dyson or, um, I forget the other fellow's name now. It was uh, mm -hmm. Tom McMillan, that's right. Um, they, they had an enormous amount of radio ads, an enormous number of um, uh, TV, and so on. What we had to do was to be as creative with our message, knowing that we would have very limited time with it to counter what the traditional dollars do for people that run rather large negative campaigns. And we, I think, creative, cr creatively created a message that, that people could grab a hold of, even though we had a radio ad, for example, in uh, I guess my third campaign that only ran about two weeks, maybe even a little bit less than that. But it caught on and started this prairie fire that people began to talk about it. Uh, I understand how difficult it is to, uh, to, to just do away with PAC money, to say that all PACs are corrupt because there's a, there's a lot of good PAC uh, communities out there, and to say that they overly influence a member of Congress because I know they don't always necessarily do that. I just go, go back to the, the basics and say that if you think about what you believe in and you understand in a broad way and in some specific way what is good for your congressional district and what is good for the country and you keep to that uh, message you're going to overcome an awful lot. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from California, Ranking Member Mr. Fazio. Thank you Mr. Chairman and let me apologize I have to go run a caucus meeting uh, and I'm just going to kind of throw out a couple of things and hope that you can respond and believe me I will get the response, even though I can't sit here and 
and hear it directly. I think everybody is focused on the small donor issue. Um, and I think it's something we all seek. It helps validate us. We have at the same time learned that direct mail is not the answer for members of the House. That may be for senators of great prominence. Certainly uh, the only members that I know of in the House who do well with direct mail or now telemarketing would be people on the ideological extremes. I know Bob Dornan has had some success. I think Ron Dellums used to. But there really isn't much that most members can do in that regard. Some have looked at the checkoff on our tax form as a way of getting small donors to participate. I don't think that is a coercive use of public funds. It's a voluntary use of public funds. But we've been unable to move it from the presidential campaign to Congress, and some would even repeal it for the presidential campaign. At the same time, we all talk about how much time we spend raising money. Every one of you would say, I want to do the job I was elected to do. I hate to have to go down to the campaign committee or over to the firm I've hired and spend my time dialing for dollars. But the implications are, if we're going to raise individual money in small amounts, we're going to spend a lot of time raising it. And as we lower limits for PACs or individuals or whatever, we're going to be spending even more to get even less. So I'd, I'd be interested in your comments about how we go about reconciling the anomaly of wanting to reduce the amount of what we receive and yet somehow reduce the amount of time we spend to raise it because I think they're in direct conflict. Uh, I would, I would want to say in addition that I think while we talk a good deal about anti-incumbency in, in the current atmosphere, whenever we look at how we fix the campaign laws, we assume a great incumbent advantage. And yet, uh, as I look at this panel, most of you are rather recent arrivals. We've only turned the House over by 50 percent plus since 1990. It's uh, not a long-term uh, assignment these days. Uh, I think most of us realize that uh, the advantages of incumbency are far more related to the political atmosphere and to anything we give to candidates for office as a tool whether it be to run the first time or to run for re-election. And, and let me just say in, in final comment, and I'm interested in your reactions, many people have come and said, I've, I've not collected PAC money. I've only run with individual money. I think you will find as a general rule, and I don't want to pick on the gentleman from Hope, but he's a good example. I'm from Pine Bluff. Though, well, I, I thought that I, I would build on the chairman's comment. He represents hope, he represents charity and faith as well. <laughs> and those who have given to his charity have uh, contributed to the tune of 60% of his money from people who contribute over $200. They're not necessarily the little people who would give 10 or 15 or 25. So uh, while I, I give you credit, Jay, you certainly deserve it for hard work in fundraising, uh, I don't think we're free of having large interested givers as part of the mix, even when we eschew PACs as a way to go. And there are ample examples of people who give to PACs who are giving $5 or $10 or what have you. Uh, whether or not they live in your district, they are contributing in small sums. So let me just conclude by saying, Carolyn, maybe you can help uh, enlighten us as to how to get that small donor. You've got a new idea about small donor PACs limited to $25. It's uh, probably typical of far more PACs than people here would, uh, would understand or believe given the talk about big money to PACs. But I do think we do all want to concentrate on how to get smaller donors back into the game. Matching funds have been suggested as a way to do it. Maybe there are other ways. Maybe people are more confident of in-district giving, as Wayne suggests. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be interested to read the remarks of my colleagues, and I have to run. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I, I propose creating a small donor citizen pack that would be limited to $25. A, a citizen would not con contribute more than $25, and this small uh, donor citizen pack would uh, be limited to a contribution from this pack uh, per election of $1,000. And uh, the time to collect that money would be uh, done by people 
who are affiliated with that PAC to take Mr. Uh, Gilchrist's example of, uh, of collecting only from your district, and in my proposal, I propose that 75 percent of your money come from your district, that uh, you could have uh, citizens for uh, Lewis that would then uh, have fundraisers and collect uh, small uh, donors. Again, I think that what you're, we want to look at is limiting the influence of, of money in the system. And we all have our examples. In my first race, my, out, my opponent outspent me um, five to one, 1 1.5 million to 250,000. Uh, and I had the example that you gave, that it was very, very difficult to raise money. In my uh, last uh, race, um, uh, both my opponent and I were very successful fundraisers. But if what we want to do is limit uh, the influence of money, I don't see any difference between a contribution from an individual and a contribution from a PAC. Maybe we need to change the mix, limit uh, uh, a third to small donor PACs, a third to big donor PACs, a third to uh, individuals. Maybe limit uh, the mix. But I don't see the difference whether a member of a union uh, contributes $25 to his PAC that then gives a candidate $500 and the executive giving a candidate uh, $500. So I feel that money is money. And uh, what we need to do is limit the influence of uh, special interest or, or money by limiting contribution limits and Jack expenditure Jones limits. Has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, don't have any specific questions. I missed the first, and I'm in the process of reading your statements now while I also listen to the answers. Uh, Mr. White, I, I, you are in favor of a commission? You, you, that yes, sir. I propose a commission, yes. You mentioned in answer to Ms. Dunn's question about PACs and about how PACs had contributed very substantially to your opponent. Um, but I take it you're not a, uh, you're a supporter of PACs. Frankly, I'm kind of agnostic on the issue. I mean, I will say that one of the, one of the troubling things is that I've noticed that I've been much more <laughs> much more successful at PAC fundraising now that I'm an incumbent than I was before, which kind of confirms my, my concern that, that there really is an advantage to incumbents. And, and as I say, uh, I really don't trust us. I don't trust Republicans or Democrats or anybody in Congress to come up with a system that's really going to be fair. And I think your best approach to get a fair system is to come up with a commission, not who, none of whom are currently elected members of Congress, and let those people try to come up with a system that works. I think that's the best approach. My understanding of the commission proposal is that it has a mechanism for those items that had two-thirds and those that had 50 percent. Uh, those that had two-thirds would automatically come to the floor. Those that had half of the commission would come and go through the regular committee yeah. process, as, as I suggest, as, as the speaker's suggestion. Uh, is that essentially what you are suggesting? Actually, Again, it's I not. Your testimony. That's the speaker's suggestion. Mine would require just a simple majority of the full commission uh, to send a proposal to Congress, and then it has to get an up or down vote under a uh, procedure kind of like the BRAC Commission. I I'd say my proposal is pretty similar to the Speaker's. Uh, great minds work alike on these things, but uh, we do have some significant differences. I won't make any comments about uh, <laughs> <laughs> that. Such a great opening, Rick, but uh, I'm I not going to take it. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Jay Dickey. Hi, Stenny. How are you? Fine, thank you. How are you doing? Your essential position is you think PACs ought to be outlawed? Yes, sir. I think it's, it's a matter of perception, not necessarily reality. Now, what does that mean, Jay? Well, what I'm, what I'm saying is that I think what, what, we, what is happening is that we're leaving the individuals out. What, what Vic said a while ago was, what can we do not to spend so much time, you know, raising money? If we're doing it to individuals, and particularly in our districts or in our states, we're participating in the forming of representation that is beneficial. You know, this business about coming back home is number one issue with my, with my people. And if we're coming back, so it's a matter of perception and not reality that we're, we're not convinced, you know, I don't think we're influenced by people who give money, let's say the machinist group in Washington state giving money to my campaign. I don't really think I'm influenced that much by it, but it's a perception of how it, how it resonates with the individual voter at the lower end of the, of the economy. And one of the things that I have argued, uh, you 
may not agree with, but uh, in 1974, of course, when PACs were first adopted, they were adopted uh, quite obviously to meet the Clement Stone issue where he took two plus million out of his pocket and gave it secretly to Nixon. And I'm sure we had people on our side just so uh, that gave a lot of money out of their pocket because they had a lot of money in their pocket. And so PACs were devised as a, an organization in, to allow relatively small contributors. Carolyn Maloney speaks to that as to how small is small, how large is large, to collectively contribute in sums sufficient to make an impact. Uh, they were a great reform. Frankly, I think they're still a reform, personally, Jay. The reason is this. If Sam Brown, Sally Jones, and Mary Smith each give $500 or $1,000 to my campaign, and list their address as 1000 uh, East 22nd Street, etc., Hyattsville, Maryland, you see that on the list, you have no idea why they gave me $1,000. They may have given me because one of them was my aunt, as Rick has. Uh, or one of them may have given to me because they want me to vote uh, X way, and I agreed to vote X way. But the fact of the matter is, it's very difficult to determine. But when the steel workers give me $1,000 or $5,000, there's no doubt in anybody's mind what the steel workers are interested in, and the public can make a determination. Hoyer is doing their bidding, or Hoyer is getting support for them because he believes in the same things they do. That's the perception. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's complicated in terms of the ultimate uh, reform was and continues to be, in my opinion, giving the public the information on which to make a informed judgment. Well, what do you think we ought to do, Steny? Uh, I think we ought to limit expenditures, uh, as we, we did in some of the bills that have passed, and, and limit the mix. I think that was a good strategy to do. I think there is obviously, as uh, Wayne Gilchrist and others have proposed, uh, and, and the uh, Republican <coughs> Party has proposed, I think, more vigorously than, than our party has, uh, greater reliance perhaps on contributions from your district. But there is obviously a downside to that because in some districts, one party, uh, usually the Republican Party, but not exclusively, has pretty much a corner on the, on the wealth of the district. Uh, and that, John Lewis has spoken to that, uh, as I understand it earlier, and that is a problem. And I don't know how we deal with that problem, and I have tended to believe that we ought not to limit to too great an extent just in uh, district. Because very frankly, what all of us do does not just impact on our district. It impacts on the entire country. Wayne Gilchrist's leadership on environmental issues impacts on my district as well as his district. And it impacts on California and Colorado and Montana as well as it does on the first district of Maryland. Uh, in any event, I thank uh, the chairman for the time, and uh, I, I agree with Ms. Dunn. This has been an interesting uh, and important hearing. Thank you, thank you chairman. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, each one of you some questions based on your testimony, but if someone else feels the spirit move them, obviously they can go ahead and, uh, and respond. And I'm trying to focus on what I consider, um, in my opinion, some of the core aspects of your testimony. Ms. Maloney, um, in the first hearing, I indicated that there's only one judge on the Supreme Court today that actually participated in the Buckley versus Vallejo decision. He was uh, Associate Justice at the time. He's now the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist. Although uh, uh, Justice Stevens was on the court, he did not participate in the decision. And your argument that perhaps we ought to test constitutional limits, I think is shared by a number of folk, uh, not just because the court has changed, but I think because times have changed to a certain extent. We have a better understanding of, uh, of what we're doing. Uh, my assumption is that the dollar amounts that you provide for your concept of a small donor, large donor pack are, are relative. They're not absolute. And that if you mentioned a $25 amount, it might be 50 or some other exactly. kind of a figure. But you want to differentiate between people who contribute larger amounts and smaller amounts. Why is the dollar amount, if it's under whatever the prescribed limit, why does that make a qualitative difference, in your opinion? 
Well, one of the things that you are trying to do is limit the mix of, of contributors uh, to campaigns. And one of the things that we're trying to do is get more small donors, more individuals involved in the political process. Why? Um, I think that that's, uh, it, it, it involves more people in their government. Uh, that they are having a direct contact, a feel that they are part of um, of the system, that are that are supporting people that they believe in. But as all of us know, that it's very very difficult to organize fundraisers and to organize outreach. Uh, as Mr. Fazio uh, mentioned very eloquently earlier, most of us spend more time than we would like fundraising. Now, there's one way we could do. We could just say we're going to limit individual contributions and pack contributions to $25. Then that would mean all of us would have to spend all our time on the phone. But, Ms. Malone, so we, used need to say, we used to say, I understand, mm -hmm. we, but I, 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 we've got to limit the responses, and uh, obviously we can go yeah. into it. We're going to have a series of hearings on this. But it used to be the old saying that time is money and that to a certain extent if people couldn't contribute, they would volunteer and that you could get services out of people without necessarily having them contribute. And one of the concerns, and we'll bring it up as we focus on political parties specifically, is that in part times have changed, in part people have changed. But it's my personal opinion, and I want to explore it with a number of people who I think will, will come before us, it's perhaps the way in which the laws have been written which have also changed the emphasis from the old time is money and therefore uh, participation is valuable versus contributions. But I think your notion that a, a structure of ability to participate on a maximum level is governed by the amount that each individual contributes places a relatively high qualitative judgment on the size of the contribution. And that, that's something that we'll obviously talk about. And I'm, for the life of me, I'm trying to figure out the qualitative advantage of being able to put more dollars in the system. Th that's the one thing that I was wrestling with uh, in terms of, of your position. Uh, Mr. Lewis. Um, May I respond very briefly? Very briefly, I, I, yes. I wasn't uh, calling for more dollars in the system. I was calling, as you know, for a limit on, on spending and a diversification of the contributors to no, no, that I, limit. I understand it. People Gilchrist who contribute less, people yeah, who contribute yes. less individually get to contribute more collectively under your system. Isn't that true? No, they would be limited to a third, a third, a third, a third for individuals. A third no, but for each pack. I thought your citizen pack could contribute twice as much, $1,000, no. versus the large donor packs, $500. That's well, incorrect? I would, I would uh, drop to $500. I would drop to $100, $100 well, individual, we're not yet writing $100 legislation. A we'll negotiate the and amount later. No, and no, no, $100, no. Uh, I don't even have a bill in yet. I'm just throwing out ideas. But I, I would, uh, okay, but I would no, fall but then to $100 an individual, no, $100 a small pack, yeah. and $100 a big pack. Yeah, so okay. my, my main point that I'm trying to make is money is money, whether it comes from a large corporation, a union, or a, or a house uh, keeper who I understand, only but makes your original $500 proposal, a, a week. Or, the or proposal you presented in your testimony was a differential in the total amount a political action committee could contribute based upon the size of the contribution of the individuals in the political action committee. And my reaction to that was why qualitatively different amounts of money of individuals allows a quantitative difference. And, and, and you've moved away from that a little bit. And, and my follow-up question would have been, it seems to me, that you're basically favoring a particular type of uh, PAC historically, and that would have been a, a, a union-based PAC mm -hmm. versus a non-union-based PAC. But the statement that you just made in terms of the amount of money uh, is not as critical, moves away from that qualitative difference. No. Now, my main point is money is money. No. And I would support, just to make it very clear, a limit of $100 an individual, $100 a large pack, and I think it would be a good idea to create a smaller pack for small contributions, $100 from a small pack. But my main thing is we want to limit the influence of money, and, and by limiting it, we can have a different mix 
And, and, and uh, again, I think that we should challenge Buckley versus Vallejo, go to the Supreme Court, and have a fallback position if we don't win in the Supreme Court. I understand that, but then the follow-up question would be, if you're going to limit to such a small amount individual contributions, would my contribution to a PAC count toward the uh, total that an individual could give? In other words, if I gave individually, I could give, under your scenario now, $100. But if I gave to 10 different PACs $100, which would be the amount that I could give, or 25, the cumulative amount of giving to PACs would be greater than the amount that an individual could give. So would you limit the contribution to PACs in that concept of yours to the total amount that could be given by an individual? In other words, through PACs, could an individual give more to a candidate than they could individually? I, I think we should limit it to an individual uh, contribution, whether you give to a PAC or your own individual contribution. Then the, then the contribution to the PACs ought to be equal to the maximum contribution that an individual could give. Otherwise, if you give to a PAC, you're giving less than you could have given if you gave individually. That's the, the point I'm trying to raise. That when you a, begin trying now, no, no, just let me, let me make, make the final statement, okay? Mm -hmm so that I can move on mm. to Mr. Lewis. When you began shifting numbers around to try to create a qualitative difference in terms of a giving situation, as, as we've seen from legislation that, that has come up since the early 1970s, you create unanticipated consequences that you have to deal with. And although I'll enjoy talking with you in terms of the mix and match of the size of contributions individually to PACs and to others, I will continue to come back at you with the consequences, either qualitatively or quantitatively, of the way in which we change the numbers. But I look forward to well, an ongoing discussion. To make it discussion. very simple. Gen no, no, I would tell the gentlewoman mm -hmm. that I would like to ask the gentleman from Georgia some questions. And your comments, uh, Mr. Lewis, I think bump up against the court decision as well. Because frankly, as you may know, in the early 1970s, uh, Congress limited the amount that individuals could contribute, and the court declared that unconstitutional. And frankly, a number of us also think we could pursue that statutorily with, with, with the new court. And I'm just wondering if, if you believe that that individual limit has a constitutional basis to it, or would you be willing to explore uh, limiting uh, individuals statutorily. I know your bill does it, but I wonder if you have any discomfort level from a constitutional point of view about telling someone that they would be restricted on how much they could contribute of their own money to their own election. Well, I have some concern uh, and that it may be a, a violation of people's uh, rights to participate. The whole question of uh, uh, freedom of speech uh, to tell a person you can only uh, use a certain amount of your own money um, is something that I like to explore. And, and, and the problem, of course, is that when we talk about freedom of speech, it's whether you do it with your own lungs or a megaphone, and unfortunately <laughs> dollars are the determination in part of whether it's your own lungs or a megaphone. Um, I, I was very um, appreciative of your focus on um, the relative uh, value of the current limit both on PACs and individuals because uh, I've tried to interview people who were involved in the process in the early 70s and what they thought about how much a thousand dollars was and how much five thousand dollars was and you know there were debates that went on on what the limit should be and they came up with what they thought was an appropriate amount of money and it wasn't $325 for individuals, and it wasn't $1,675 for PACs. It was $1,000 for individuals and $5,000 uh, for PACs. And I said, at the time, why didn't you think about indexing it? And their answer was, we thought that was a lot of money. <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, I guess back in 1974, $1,000 for a lot of people appeared to be a lot of money, and $5,000 appeared. But uh, today in... Uh, in 1995, and we moved toward 1996. It's really you can't get that much for a thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, Three hundred twenty-five dollars maybe, and for five thousand, sixteen hundred a little more of yeah. goods. Do, do you think, and 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 maybe this is almost a rhetorical question, because it seems to me that this is the attitude of people who want to keep contributions even lower than they are now, relatively by dropping the amount that people could contribute that apparently in the 1970s, $1,000 was kind of a, a level, a, a corruptible level, let's say. Above that, you were worried about it. Does it really mean that today the corruptible level is the 
$25? Or? I'm not so sure. Uh, I don't think we should uh, limit, uh, we should bring it down. Uh, maybe the level that we have, maybe it should remain there. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I must tell you, I, I do accept PAC money, and, and I don't feel beholden to any organization or any PAC that I receive uh, dollars from. And as my colleague from New York suggested, money is money. Uh, you have little people pooling their resources. It may be a group of janitors coming together, uh, working in a, in a union, a group of business people, but money is money. And, and, and of course, uh, the key is to disclose it, and that was the, the first and the basic principle of our current campaign. Uh, finance and, and, and we must continue to disclose all our contributions. Yeah, and I would just uh, refer to you, and I'll, I'll, I'll use your testimony as an example. Wall Street Journal today has a very interesting editorial. Uh, it's titled, The Man Who Ruined Politics. And um, it's a picture of Fred Wertheimer uh, <laughs> and an editorial about uh, their view on the way in which campaigns should be run. Mr. Gutierrez, I, 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 I read your, um, and we're going to visit over lunch a couple of times. Um, <laughs> the, the idea that uh, when you listen to the structure initially, it sounds frankly somewhat Rube Goldberg and rather complicated, but when you take a step back and look at it fundamentally, basically what you're saying is that if people are so itchy and anxious to participate in the system and it's above a fixed level and they're willing to pay a tax for it, then uh, that'll help money come into the system and we can use it, kind of like a gas guzzler tax. If you want the big car and if you want to be seen in the neighborhood, then you've got to pay for it with a gas guzzler tax. Is that a fair analogy of the way you're looking at where you're going to get some money with this... Uh, well, tax uh, on PACs. Mr. Chairman, let me just um, say that the, um, and we got this from the Democratic side, from the DCCC, the information. They said that the um, average uh, candidate received $50,000 in PAC contributions, and that approximately 30000 of that 50000 was above the $1,000 mm -hmm. level. So that if we had my PAC tax uh, on the basis of 2,593 candidates at 11,888 per candidate taxing the overexpenditure, we've got about $30 million here in a pool. Now, I think the important thing is that we, I kind of take a middle road with this PAC tax. I don't say we're going to get rid of them together. I say we use them as a tool and an instrument and kind of rein them in, as you suggest. Uh, if you want to give the big $5,000, you can still give it, but there's a tax that helps other people. So I thought, look, it helps us because, remember, under my proposal, has currently drafted, and I look forward to having those lunches with you. Um, we'll make sure that no PAC picks up the tab as we do that. Um, that $200 or less in contributions get maxed by this pool of money. Now, it's not public money because it comes from a tax on PACs. So it's not public money, and it would encourage a candidate. So, and, and only the candidates who say, I will uh, limit my campaign expenditures to $600,000 get to be in the pool. So I think it helps us do a couple of things. It says, go out and raise $200 or less contributions and you're going to get matched by those contributions. And if the candidate spends a whole bunch of money, as in your, um, your uh, imagery that you gave us, if you got that big old Cadillac out there, right, and you got the million dollar campaign, it gets taxed to help the, maybe the, uh, the guy driving the, uh, I'm trying to think of the Saturn, because I want to mention an American car. There you here. go. There you go. Yeah, and the other thing I like about it is that it shows some creative thinking in terms of looking for sources of money that could be utilized in the system that doesn't automatically go to the Treasury and utilize taxpayer dollars. And one other suggestion, Mr. Chairman, and, and you know, you were very helpful in um, uh, getting my proposal for three months before and um, uh, for, frank, for the franking. And if we could, like, look at, I know it doesn't deal specifically, but since I have you right here in front of me, if we could get yeah, that. You can go out of the box. Go yeah. ahead. If we could, another suggestion is if we could get that permanently it, as we discuss campaign finance reform so that it's part of the mix. Thank you. Um, I tell a gentleman from, uh, from Washington that he's new to politics and new to the House and part of the new majority. And one of the things we've done around here is broken most of the molds about what people think we would or would not do. And I will tell you that as chairman of this committee, 
uh, I am uh, not inclined to create a system that favors incumbents beyond whatever an inherent advantage to an incumbent might be. There are some inherent uh, disadvantages to being an incumbent. One of them is that you have a voting record. Uh, but there are a number of uh, non-inherent advantages to incumbency currently in the structure, and I think those are the ones you're focusing on. And, uh, and frankly, I have no interest in perpetuating um, non-inherent advantages to incumbency. And so uh, we've already broken some, some molds on some votes that we've done, some packages we've put together, and I look forward to working with, with you in that area. Mr. Dickey, you talk about PACs being primarily a perceptive problem rather than a realistic problem, and PAC proponents would argue, I think, to a certain extent, that uh, what PACs have done is brought people into the system through education and uh, involvement, uh, and perhaps even stimulated interest in elections through that education and through the shared contributions that they might make. Um, do you have any feeling about if, in fact, you didn't allow PACs to participate, that the dollars that the individuals now give through the PAC system would flow into the political system um, without PACs, or would there be possibly a diminishing of the participation? Because Ms. Maloney's concern, obviously, is that we want to try to get, keep those people involved in the system. And if you do away with PACs, do you think the dollars and the individuals involved would move to another venue or avenue, or would they perhaps not be involved? I think they'd evaporate. Now, here's what some of them would. A certain percentage, and maybe a substantial percentage, would evaporate at first. Because most of the people I talk to who give to PACs, first of all, don't feel like they have any access to the decision making at all. They realize that the lobbyists have their own agenda, their own politics is going on, and they're outside of the picture just like they are otherwise. And they give to the PACs to keep their jobs or to buy a little piece. I think it'd be up to us to go and find those people and go and get back with them and try to bring them into the system. And let me say one other thing is that what we're trying to do is make better decisions in government. That's the reason why it's important to go to the individuals and ask them for their support. And when you ask them for their support and they say, oh, no, I wouldn't dare support you because of so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, so -and -so, you're getting an opinion. Or, yes, I'm going to give this to you because of your opinion. Individual opinions collectively makes a stronger rope to carry our government with. And I guess my response would be, why aren't PACs individual connections delivered collectively, but we'll pursue that. Mr. Gilchrist, when you talk about 100% of your contributions coming from people who live in the district, what role do you envision or believe political parties should pay, play in that scenario? Would it be the political party helping you to structure those individual contributions? Would it be the political party could be involved in an in-kind way? or that you would prefer the political parties not be involved, that you focus on individuals only? Um, we have, we have uh, in my individual case, chosen not to take any party money, national party, state party. Uh, we, we take no, no party money. Um, I do think, and, and I, I want to agree with Jay and some of the other people that talked to you, that the, it, it really does, we, we can't put aside the individual potential for creating and stimulating initiative on the part of the voters to participate in the political system. That's, in my mind, infinitely more important than all the dollars you could collect. Uh, if people feel that they're attached to a candidate or a representative, then they're going to come out. And, and it's the responsibility of the candidate and the elected official to do that. I, I have no qualms with increasing and putting that aside. If the state political party, Democrat or Republican, wanted to participate uh, through the existing laws right now, no more, but through existing laws to, to contribute to campaigns, uh, I would accept that. I think I would also accept on the national level, the Democrat or the Republican party, through existing laws to uh, as far as what they contribute to an individual candidate. And just one other comment, as far as the $1,000 contribution, I wouldn't change what individuals can give as well. And I realize $1,000 doesn't go as far as it used to go. 
It's just, and then we're going to have a hearing on uh, on the role of political parties. That some of us think that political parties are unique institutions in the system. They're the only ones who recruit candidates, then attempt to get them elected, and also program public policy. And and I think all of those happen to be important functions, and they're the only institutions that perform all three of them, and that uh, others are involved in other aspects of it. And uh, uh, although, Mr. Chairman, I wasn't recruited nor drafted. I just sort of dropped out of the sky on the four Republicans. I, I understand that, and, and the gentleman has a fascinating story, and I think our job is not to pass legislation on unique individual instances, but rather look at the, uh, at, at the larger uh, collective. Uh, final statement. Uh, in terms of the question that Mr. Fazio posed uh, uh, rhetorically and, 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 and to individuals about if, in fact, you're for smaller uh, dollar amounts in the system, what about the time spent on raising those smaller dollar amounts, as he called dialing for dollars? Uh, I think there is uh, a, a difference in terms of, of where you get dollars, not just uh, how much. And that I think one of the concerns is that in the current system, uh, you get more dollars faster staying away from your district most often than you do coming to your away from your district most often than you do coming to your district. You can go to large urban centers where dollars can be given in concentrated events. And that's why I think a number of people, uh, Mr. Gilchrist talked about 100 percent, which I think has some constitutional problems. Ms. Maloney talked about 75 percent in her testimony. Uh, I think maybe we do have to go back to the criteria that um, Buckley versus Vallejo established, which I think is a useful one as we go through this pursuit, and that is, does it uh, assist us in dealing with either corruption or the appearance of corruption in the way in which we focus on the parameters of givers and giving? And it seems to me that, and the gentleman from Maryland mentioned this, that if we focus in terms of um, creating some kind of a, of a system that focuses more on individuals who could participate uh, in the process, that is, in district, that the time spent interacting with people in the district wouldn't necessarily be seen as time wasted by most people because, after all, you're interacting with those people who you are supposed to represent. Mr. Notwithstanding Chairman. the fact you tend to represent people outside your district as well, they are the determiners of whether or not you return to office by virtue of being able to vote for you. Could I say Mr. something Chairman. in that respect? Sure. Please, sir. And I want to draw an analogy to the Walmart um, system that has been so successful in merchandising. What they, what, there was a definite turn of events, as I'm told, and as I've observed, with Walmart, when they went to their associates and said, you give us your ideas, you're the ones who are actually, the rubber's hitting the road with you all, we're here in, in Ivory Tower, our ideas aren't seeming to work, aren't, 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 do not seem to work. And what happened was Walmart came up and they started saving money. They had innovations. They got they got enormous amount of of, uh, of ideas and and support and and uh, and structure from that experience. Now I don't want to bore this panel with this point, but I want to say that we're trying to get better decisions. We're trying to create a better working government. Why in the world are we trying to ignore the very people who come in in contact? with the mistakes and they can see ideas better. If we set up a system where we're going to them and asking them for their money, whatever it might be, we're gonna get that strength of, of, of suggestions and creativity from them by the very system of raising money. And what I'm saying to you is then we say the time we spend raising money is making our, our whole government better and we turn this thing all the way around so we're on the flip side of it rather than saying, oh my gosh, it takes so much time to raise money, which is your point you just got through making, that if we go and we get to the bottom of this and bring it up, then we're, we're going to be a lot better off. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, gentlemen, for his observation. Gentlemen from Georgia. Money from John, use the mic. That money from Political Action Committee is somehow is outside that is for and that is not connected to the local uh, district or to that state or to that indigenous community. Uh, when you get money, I know in my case from a political action committee that may be based in Washington or New York or California, it is that recommendation on, of the people in the district, uh, in that city or in that state or that county. And many of those people, many of those people have contributed 
participated in that pool. So uh, we should look at PACs as something that is foreign, that is something strange or weird or obscene about it. And I think we have an obligation to so these people have a right to pool their resources to have the greatest impact. And in fact, uh, they currently are legally allowed to do so. I, I want to thank uh, uh, the panel and the members for, for uh, indulging the chairman in trying to get to some basic concerns. But I believe the gentleman from Ohio who, who arrived after we began might want to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I said one question. I'm sorry, I arrived late. I had something else I was uh, required to be at. You know, everybody has a story to tell. I defeated a former member or a former chairman of this committee, actually, uh, against some incredible odds 15 years ago back in the State House. And um, I had mixed opinions at that time about, uh, you know, the groups helping him, the groups helping me. And he had a lot of uh, PAC, PAC money, and I had some PAC money, but I thought his was appropriate PACs, uh, and I thought mine were. And, and I think if you start to pick it, I like this PAC, but I don't like that PAC. And our campaign since then. I've had labor money, I've had small business uh, packs, whatever the issue is. And in the last campaign, I had more individual money. Uh, I think that's to each their own and how they, they view the system. Uh, so I personally don't think that if you say packs and the pack came from Washington, if a farmer contributes or a labor union contributes and the money comes to Washington and, and they support you, it's still your local people, your local farmer, your local labor person, your local business person. So I, I, I think some of the pack has been sent to a hyper level here in Washington over the airwaves and, and it has been made worse, you know, than it is. I think it's how you approach and do you call up and say, I want contributions. I think that type of thing is wrong. So, but having said that, I guess my real concern, and I would aim more of the questions to the people who want to ban PACs, but also I'd, I'd ask the panelists, more of my concern for the future of politics if we set campaign limits, which I have no problem to set limits on how much the PACs give. What about the millionaires? This week we've heard so many millionaire members of Congress say, let's stop the paychecks. I'd be willing to do that if they would stop their trust funds and all their money that they make on the outside that, that's, that's legal, that's inherent, or whatever their inherited monies are. So sometimes it's real easy to stand there and say, let's stop the paychecks with the members or, or let's limit things. But what about the millionaires? And, and I've heard today from panelists after panelists, money is money. My real concern is that we have limits on, on the groups that can give, we have limits on the individuals, and, and that's fine in itself. But what about the millionaires who can sit there and just dump in as much money as they want? So the people who want to ban PACs, where do you stand on the millionaires? Uh, let me address that, although, as I said, I'm not, uh, I haven't decided that I necessarily would want to ban PACs. I think we need to leave that to a group that's not uh, necessarily going to be biased the way we are because we've all been in the system. But uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, the Supreme Court, how it might change some of its rulings in the Buckley versus Vallejo case. And I think we have to remember one of the problems with the campaign finance system we have right now is that half of the system enacted in 1974 was ruled unconstitutional in Buckley versus Vallejo. I think it's very much incumbent upon us to think about the constitutionality of things we do. My own view as a lawyer is that it is unconstitutional to restrict what an individual can spend, but frankly, I think it's probably also unconstitutional to restrict what an individual can give. And I think one of the things I'd like to have a commission look at is whether maybe we should take all the limits off, but just require full disclosure. I think that would be one approach that maybe a commission with some academic um, uh, empowerment and academic contributions to, I might be able to come up with a proposal like that better than we can. I would also like to say one one idea about the whole concept of spending limits. I think just about everybody who's talked today has talked about spending limits. But really, when you get right down to it, just about any limit on any kind of campaign finance uh, in any direction is always going to disfavor the challenger, in my view, because you've already got the incumbent there with the advantages that incumbency has, and of course the disadvantages too. For example, the $600,000 number that people talk about, it just so happens that if you look at the academic studies, 600000 was the threshold at the point at which a, a, a challenger in 1994 started to become viable. So if you limit it at $600,000, you are basically already um, making it very difficult for a, for a challenger who isn't well known to get beyond the threshold to where they can be well known. And the last thing I would say is, we talk a lot about limiting campaign contributions to your own district. Well, you know, my Aunt Wanda lives in Indiana. And so if I started uh, uh, my campaign solely from people in the district, I wouldn't have been able to, to uh, get to the point where I could attract other contributions. So I just think we have to look very carefully at all these limitations, including the limitation on millionaires. 
Bob, I'm not in favor of, of banning PACs, just PAC contributions. Is that, I, I want to make sure we're, we're clear on that. Uh, just the PAC contributions you see. And I don't, now, the, in the question of the millionaire, if it favors the millionaire, I, I, I'm against that. You see, if in fact, then, then they could come in and control a race just by their own that's, resources. That's what concerns me. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a valid point, is it, if the millionaire is advantaged. Oh, Mr. Lewis, Mr. Gilchrist. Well, you know, I support the political action committee, and I have real reservations about uh, limiting the amount of money that an individual can put into his, his or her own campaign. Um, Mr. Ney, you talked about diversity. Let each person do their own. I'll, I'll make three quick comments. One, I think we need biological diversity in our legislation to protect the environment. Number two, I came here to contribute my perspective, and I realize all of us need to contribute a perspective to, to unlock this problem. So uh, I would not mind a little bit of diversity depending on what one district needs, another district is a little bit different. So diversity to allow flexibility um, in a campaign finance reform bill I think would be the best way to go. The, other, the last comment I want to make is about Walmart. Walmart might be good for Arkansas, but Walmart has used their dollars. Instead of creating fine little communities and little stores, they've pushed their way into communities that don't want them. Now, I hope Walmart stays in Arkansas and they're prosperous, but they've pushed their way around the country and in my district, and, and they've gone too far. Campaign finance reform flexibility, I think, is the way to go, Mr. Chairman. Certainly. Uh, let me make it very clear, I'm, and I'm not opposed personally to millionaires. You ought to have people out here of all socio backgrounds, gender backgrounds, race backgrounds, and that's what makes a, a great uh, Congress. I'm just concerned that they can buy elections if allowed unlimited amounts of money, so I have no personal problem with, uh, with millionaires. Uh, maybe I'd like to be one. I won't be. But <laughs> and, and with that, I tell the gentleman that we are going to have a hearing on the individual contributions, not just the amount, but obviously the question of millionaires and the rest. Gentleman from Washington. I don't want to start a second round of questions, but, but um, I tend to agree with those of you on the panel that believe that people should have the right to contribute through PACs. And I, I also would say that equalizing uh, what PACs can contribute with what an individual can give might be the right way to go. But I think we're dealing with some very serious uh, public perceptions. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure because I always take the deliberative approach. Let's strip away the emotionalism and find the real problem and the real answer to the problem. I'm not sure we can solve the whole problem here. But it is true that the public perceives that we are sitting in Washington, D.C., picking up the phone and calling PACs to get $5,000 donations at one whack instead of getting home to talk to the individuals that we represent in the Congress. That's a big problem. We've got to figure out how to handle that. Um, that is a problem that may be solved by equalizing PACs. But I think, as I said before, it's got to be an integrated program. The result that I would like to see is one uh, that would make the situation competitive. A lot of times, again, another public perception, PACs, and, and also a reality, PACs give to a candidate, usually the incumbent, because of the almost guarantee that the incumbent will be reelected. At one point a couple years ago, the percentage was 94 percent. So a PAC is going to be very, very risk taking oriented if they're going to give to a challenger to an incumbent who will be there to deal negatively PACs may perceive with the issues that PACs are interested in so these are public perceptions and we've got to figure out how to solve it the answer to that one of course is to make the field more competitive make the incumbency less of a guarantee for re-election so that uh, PACs can be truly a democratic representation of a group of folks who want to give money to the candidate who espouses an agenda that they approve of. Exactly. Th thank you, gentlewoman. And I want to thank the panel once again. Uh, as uh, the next panel comes up, I'd probably like to get it started. Uh, as an editorial comment, I would uh, refer you once again to the man who ruined politics in uh, the Wall Street Journal. Fred Wertheimer had a common cause, in my personal opinion, is one of the primary reasons uh, tell a gentlewoman from Washington that the public perceives us the way we do and the distance between perception and reality. A uh, second panel is, in fact, a, a group of individuals who partially from academia and uh, uh, through uh, real-world involvement uh, have as a part of their uh, activities the involvement with the question of political action committees. 
Uh, Edward Crane, the president of Cato, Stephen Stockmeyer, the executive vice president of the National Association of Business PACs, uh, Joel Goros, dean of the Brooklyn Law School, would be uh, representing the American Civil Liberties Union, Ken Parmalee, vice president of government affairs of the Rural Letter Carriers uh, Association, Steve Dressler, vice president of government affairs and national association of realtors. I understand all of you folks have uh, pressing time engagements. I would love to interact with you all afternoon, but if you have to leave, I understand you do. And I would try to get at least one uh, panelist in prior to having to go uh, vote. And I would begin with the uh, gentleman from Cato, Mr. Crane. <coughs> Thank you. And uh, let me say that the chair would indicate that if you have written testimony, it will be made a part of the record without objection, and we would like to have you proceed it uh, any way you may wish to inform uh, the committee for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I congratulate you and, and the speaker on your uh, principled stand on an issue that is not as popular as it should be at this uh, point in time. I appreciate, too, the opportunity to address this committee. I have a few brief points to make. First, when we talk about PACs and their impact on the political process, we are talking, in my view, about a non-problem. It's true the media doesn't like PACs, but they tend to oppose any political force that can bypass their filter. And it's true that certain members of Congress like to demagogue the issue when they go back to their district on a white horse and say, I voted to clean up the system, I voted against PACs, as though that means something. Mr. Chairman, the average PAC gives less than $1,000 to House candidates and less than $2,000 to Senate candidates. The implication of those demagogues is that their colleagues will roll over and play dead or stand on their heads or do whatever they're asked to for these modest contributions. There is absolutely no evidence that that is the case. In the debate over PACs, rhetoric and reality are two different things. PACs are a non-problem. There is simply no evidence that they do anything other than enhance the democratic process. And in my view, it is insulting to members of Congress to suggest otherwise. Second, a Cato Institute study by Brad Smith cited in the Wall Street uh, Journal article uh, the chairman mentioned and earlier in the week by uh, David Broder of the Washington Post cites empirical research showing that the top three factors influencing the way a congressman votes have nothing at all to do with money. The first factor that influences votes is ideology. Most members, of course, get into politics because they have strong views about various political issues. The second, and that ideology stays with them through their career. The second uh, factor is party agenda. We, for better or for worse, have a two-party system in America, and the leadership uh, constructs certain uh, voting strategies that affects the way members vote. The third is voter uh, sentiment back home. In fact, members uh, are very interested on many issues, uh, keenly interested in what people back home in their district think. So those are the major factors that affect the way members vote, and that has nothing to do with money. That also brings up an ancillary point, because whatever influence PACs do have is more likely to be can I a... tell the gentleman on the ancillary point, can we hold it, because we've got less than uh, 10 minutes to get over and vote, and we'll be right back, and you can then finish your testimony when we come back. I was hoping I could get it in before we had to go vote, but the committee stands temporarily in recess. How rude you such a good... I was on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> When we were last in session, uh, Mr. Crane was making an ancillary point. <coughs> um, the uh, <clears throat> point dealt with the reason uh, why members vote as they vote, and uh, my point was that it had little to do with, uh, with money, mostly with ideology, with uh, party agenda, and with voter sentiment. 
which, as I mentioned, brought up an ancillary point because whatever influence PACs do have is more likely to be a function of their ability to mobilize their supporters than it is to uh, cut a check for up to $5,000. That's why groups ranging from the Christian Coalition to the NRA to the labor unions to the NFIB get the attention that they do because they deserve it. They, have, uh, they represent millions of Americans who happen to feel strongly about certain issues. What in the world could be wrong with that? There's also the reality of PAC spending. There's plenty of competition for the attention of members on any major issue, and that competition often comes from PACs on the other side of the issue. Furthermore, members are free to reject PAC contributions anytime they want to, and those contributions are in any case fully disclosed. Now, if the case for eliminating or restricting PACs is ultimately driven by a desire to get money out of politics, then that case is based on a faulty assumption. As the uh, speaker said the other day, we are spending too little money on po political campaigns, not too much. Uh, for obvious reasons, it is in the electoral interest of incumbents to restrict spending and quiet the campaign. Incumbents invariably start the campaign with a huge advantage in name recognition. The less vibrant the campaign, the better their chances for re-election. As Brad Smith's study makes clear, the more money spent in a campaign, the better informed are the voters. Further, each additional dollar has more benefit for the challenger than for the incumbent. So, Mr. Chairman, we can very well see what Congress was up to when it passed the 1974 Federal Election Campaign Act. People forget, but part of that act that was struck down by the Supreme Court involved $70,000 spending limits for House races, $100,000 spending limits for Senate races, or eight cents a voter. Uh, what kind of disdain uh, for the political process and contempt for the American voter is involved with saying we will allow spending on campaigns up to eight cents per voter? Mr. Chairman, America spends more money today on yogurt than on presidential campaigns. We spend about $3 per eligible voter on average uh, congressional races. How can $3 uh, get common cause uh, so apoplectic? Brad Smith estimates we spend in every two-year election cycle somewhere between seven and a half and ten dollars per eligible voter on all election campaigns, from dog catcher to state legislature to Congress to the presidency. So those who suggest we're spending too much on campaigns are either ignorant of the facts or pursuing some other agenda. Finally, I would address the constitutional question of banning PACs. The chairman may be aware of Congressman uh, J.D. Hayworth's efforts to create a constitutional caucus in the House. There are now, as I understand it, approximately 100 members of that caucus, the purpose of which is to take seriously uh, a congressman's oath of office to uphold the Constitution. We tend to think that that oath is only taken by Supreme Court justices and the president. But uh, a congressman is not supposed to vote for a piece of legislation that he or she feels is unconstitutional and should weigh uh, the constitutionality of, um, of any issue before Congress before voting on it. I would urge members to consider the First Amendment before voting on any legislation dealing with limiting or, um, or uh, restricting PACs. Uh, let me just read briefly from the First Amendment. Con this is a, a, a short amendment, as you know. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Mr. Chairman, free speech, the right of assembly, and the right to petition Congress are sometimes interdependent. PACs are an excellent example of that very fact. As the Supreme Court said in Buckley v. Vallejo, dollars are not stuffed into ballot boxes. The mediating factor that turns money into votes is speech. Advocacy cannot be proscribed because it's effective. It's estimated that some 12 million Americans contribute about $12 a month to PACs each year. I think that's a good thing. It is not a problem. I would respectfully suggest that Congress lift contribution limits for individuals and leave PACs alone. That would be real reform in the interest of healthy and vibrant democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Stockmeyer. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, this is the sixth time my group has been involved in testimony before Congress on this issue, but it's the only time that two days of hearings have been devoted to PACs with the diversity and balance that's been brought to this. And we appreciate that very much, and we think you're doing a real public service by examining this issue fully. Um, authorized fully in the 1976 amendments to the Federal Election Campaign Act, PACs today are the virtual embodiment of American pluralism and among the finest examples of Americans exercising their rights to participate in the nation's political process. Currently, over 4,000 PACs represent almost as many different interests, covering the total spectrum of citizen, economic, issue, and the philosophical spectrum. PACs have educated, motivated, and stimulated a rough estimated 12 million Americans in the, in the political process voluntarily, and many of them for the very first time. In the last 20 years, uh, PACs have become the premier way for Americans of average means to band together and support the election of candidates that, believe, that they believe have their best interest at heart. Through PACs, like-minded citizens uh, can have more impact and be more involved in campaigns uh, than they could acting alone. And far more than mere fundraising and dispensing operations, PACs promote greater citizen participation in all elements of government through publications, seminars, vote drives, and the like. What's more, PACs are one of the few reforms of the 70s, if not the only reform, which has worked as, as, as intended and worked very well. The PAC me mechanism took what was under the table before and without limit, brought it into the sunshine under tight limits and regulation. Since their creation, there have been no, I repeat, no significant abuses attributable to PACs. The sanctioning of PACs thus helped clean up a major part of the old discredited system of campaign finance and continues to do so to this very day. Because of all these positive achievements, we submit PACs are a very healthy part of the current system and should be considered a model reform which could be applied to other parts of the system. As long as we have private funding of campaigns, something that's certainly more desirable than taxpayer funding and will always be guaranteed by the Constitution, there never will be a cleaner or better form of involvement than political action committees. Unfortunately, however, PACs have become the whipping boy of the campaign finance debate. For 20 years, professional reform groups have engaged in McCarthy-like attack on PACs, and this narrow view has been repeated by an unquestioning media. A recent study showed that 98.4 percent of media coverage of PACs since 1980 is negative, a higher negative percentage than those for Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh or retired Los Angeles police detective Mark Furman. These unprovoked attacks have created a false impression of corruption uh, through innuendo, guilt by association, and constant repetition. As the most fully disclosed part of the campaign system, PACs have, are obvious and easy targets for this kind of attack. But these attempts to smear PACs and the recipients of their support, I believe, are a part of a larger strategy to discredit all forms of private financing in order to build a case for forcing taxpayers to foot the bill. We are concerned that these tactics have been so successful in creating a political imperative, although I believe a phony imperative, that members of the House have felt it necessary to introduce a record number of anti-PAC bills this year. We would urge that this committee pause before getting caught up in this hysteria to consider the positive role of PACs and the very negative consequences of these proposals. Campaign finance law has always been uniquely plagued by unintended consequences. And here's some of the things would happen if we banned PACs or significantly reduced them. Broad citizen participation in funding campaigns would be reduced and the vital role that PACs have played to encourage involvement beyond funding would be lost. Number two, candidates would have to spend even more time raising funds than they do today, just the reverse of what people would like to accomplish. Number three, an even greater advantage for and reliance on wealthy individuals would develop and small minority groups would be shut down, leading to domination by the larger, more well-heeled interests. Four, campaign money would be less accountable as interests are forced to channel their support in largely undisclosed and unlimited ways. Voter communication and education would also suffer. We think we should also uh, consider the constitutional grounds, which others will go into about uh, 
the illegality under the Constitution of banning PACs. If it's the appearance of influence peddling that Congress seeks to correct, there are any number of remedial approaches the committee should consider shy of trampling on the rights of average Americans to associate for political expression. Finally, we submit that there's almost nothing about the appearance problems of the current system that could not be solved by the conduct of the members of Congress themselves. There's nothing that forces our representatives to raise more than they need for their campaigns, to raise funds all year round, or to solicit or accept funds from sources with business before their committees. If voluntary restraint is not sufficient, then the House should pass mandatory restraints as a part of its ethics rules as you're doing on gifts today. If the appearance problems are indeed as severe as some suggest, then each member of Congress needs to be part of the solution by examining and restricting demand. NAPPAC believes there is a historic opportunity here to pass some constructive reforms, whether it's through the immediate work of this committee or the broader agenda suggested by the Speaker in his Blue Ribbon Commission. NAPPAC supports both efforts. We think the challenge is restoring public confidence and increasing participation in the system while very definitely protecting precious constitutional guarantees. Thank you very much, Mr. Stockman. As I introduce our uh, next witness, Mr. Gara, Truth in Packaging requires me to reveal that I have just learned that uh, he was a participant in the Buckley versus Vallejo decision, which has so much shaped campaign finance in this country. Mr. Gara. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Joel Gora. I'm Associate Dean and Professor of Law at Brooklyn Law School. And I'm privileged to appear before you today on behalf of the... Could I ask you, Dean Gore, to speak directly into the microphone? They're very narrow range. I'm delighted to Thank appear you. here today on behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, I do bear some small responsibility for the fact that we're all here this afternoon. <laughs> and I couldn't be more proud because Buckley versus Vallejo is a landmark of political freedom. Uh, the only problem is the court didn't go quite far enough. Uh, in that case, uh, the lawyers for the plaintiffs uh, contended that the campaign reforms of 1974 uh, were anything but, that they were bad constitutional law because they cut to the core of the First Amendment, and they were bad political reform because they would magnify the power of incumbency, increase dependence on moneyed interests, and stifle political opportunity, and I'm afraid uh, we were right. In Buckley, the court ruled that any government restriction of political funding is a regulation of political speech subject to the strictest scrutiny. The court further ruled that limitations on expenditures flatly violate the First Amendment. Nothing can justify the government telling the people how much they can spend to promote their candidacies or their causes. Nothing. But the court upheld contribution limits of $1,000 for individuals, but $5,000 for political committees, uh, based upon the uh, concern with corruption. And that ruling has ensured the two decades of frustration and unfairness that have ensued. With no limits on spending or on wealthy candidates, with independent committees free uh, to speak on politics, with issue groups and the media free to speak on politics uh, without limit, and with uh, less well-funded candidates hampered in their ability to raise money from family and friends, uh, the stage was set for the two factors that have dominated uh, politics for the last 20 years, the advantages of incumbency and the dependency on PACs. The ACLU has long suggested that the way to solve these problems is to expand politi political participation by providing public financing for all legally qualified candidates and not to restrict contributions and expenditures which help groups and individuals communicate their messages. And that brings me to PACs. PACs, of course, have become a political dirty word. But PACs reflect the broad spectrum of groups that enrich our political life. Proposals to restrict or repeal PAC and PAC activity, I think, are both unconstitutional and unwise. Uh, you've heard from Mr. Crane and Mr. Stockmeyer about the broad overview of the role of PACs, but I think nothing was more eloquent than Congressman Lewis's testimony this morning. For he indicated the two things about PACs that the ACLU has always tried to say. Number one, they do embody political speech and association. And number two, they are particularly important, many of them, to sparking new candidacies from divergent members of our community, new and different voices, and not the ones that are uh, traditionally heard. And so um, uh, efforts to limit uh, or ban PAC contributions to restrict the amount of money uh, that, that candidates 
can spend based on PAC contributions to ban out-of-state PAC contributions all violate these principles of political freedom, of First Amendment rights, uh, and of uh, political reform. Um, there is a way out of this morass that the campaign reforms of two decades ago uh, have caused. And the way is the path that the framers of the First Amendment charted for us a long time ago. The First Amendment answer to bad or corrupt or excessive or overinflated speech is more speech, publicly funded, privately funded, more speech, rather than enforced silence coerced by law. And the elements of this time-honored approach under the First Amendment are clear. Number one, raise individual contributions. Let Aunt Wanda write an even bigger check to Representative White. Uh, that alone would reduce the reliance on PACs and increase political freedom. Give a modest tax credit for political contributions. I think that was once in our law. I took it a time or two. Uh, and it was a pleasure to uh, make a contribution and get a tax credit at the same time. Um, third, public and effective disclosure of large contributions leads to the democratic remedy uh, for special interests. Let the people decide who is too cozy uh, with those special interests. Uh, and finally, provide subsidies and benefits, perhaps free frank, reduced mail, but do it on an, on an even-handed basis. Don't do it just for established candidates. Don't do it just for Republicans and Democrats. I'm intrigued by the idea of a bipartisan blue ribbon commission that will look into these difficult issues. And I noticed that it is supposed to have eight Republicans and eight Democrats. Where's the Socialist Workers' Party representative, let alone the Libertarian Party or all of the other third and independent parties that enrich political life in America? and who traditionally have been the sources for the new ideas that we have come to accept as commonplace. Um, um, remember that leveling the playing field uh, means that uh, challenges will have a better chance to defeat incumbents. Uh, no one uh, is born an incumbent. Uh, one of the collateral, collateral benefits of making it easier to raise money is that candidates will be able to spend less time raising money and more time raising issues. The problem is the strategies I've outlined, which have one thing in common, expanding political opportunity without limiting it, limiting it, have really never, ever been tried. What we said to the Supreme Court in Buckley 20 years ago was, allow unlimited expenditures, unlimited contributions, and have full disclosure so that the people can determine who's spending too much and who's giving too much. That approach was not permitted by the result in the Buckley case, but it's the, the approach that's most consistent with uh, the one part of the Constitution that speaks specifically to this issue, to the issue of members of Congress writing the rules by which their own re-election futures are determined. And the part of the Constitution that speaks specifically to that was shared a few moments ago, and the first uh, five words of it are, Congress shall make no law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Gora. Uh, Mr. Driesler, I believe I mispronounced your name earlier. I apologize. That's quite all right, Mr. Chairman. My name is Steve Driesler. I'm Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Association of Realtors. I'm here on behalf of the 750,000 realtors nationwide who reside in literally every state, every congressional district, every town, village, and hamlet of this great country. As part of my duties, I help administer the Realtors Political Action Committee, which is one of the largest and most successful political action committees in the country. And I'm really here today, Mr. Chairman, to talk about citizenship and what PACs do and what our PAC in particular does to enhance and expand citizens and citizenship and opportunity to participate in this great political system of ours. You know, I've heard the testimony here today and you hear uh, political pundits and observers decry the lack of citizen involvement, the lack of political participation. I think all of us were taught from our very earliest days in, in Civics 101 that political activity, political involvement is the highest responsibility of a citizen. And yet by almost any measure, the level of political involvement in this country is at historical all-time lows. Compared to most other industrial uh, nations in the world, we rank low in, in all these indices, such as voter participation, simply going to the polls on election day to help determine who is going to lead, uh, lead us, be it at the state, local, or national level. 
We have a citizenship that is woefully and adequately informed about their public officials and about the great issues of the day. Uh, fewer than a third of most uh, citizens can name their members of Congress, much less tell you how they vote on key issues that affect them, their business, their personal lives. We decry the lack of involvement of the lack of volunteers that come to work in political campaigns. Uh, we talk about that campaigns have become too much focused on personalities and not enough focused on a discussion of issues. We've heard even here today people talking about the influence or the per per perception of undue influence that large contributors have in the political system, the, the so-called fat cats uh, who can give of their own wealth either to finance their own campaigns or to support other candidates. Well, let me tell you how the Realtors Political Action Committee, we think, helps address and, uh, and eliminate uh, many of these problems that are affecting us today. Let's talk about citizen involvement. Every year, RPAC involves over 140,000 realtors nationwide in getting them to write a check, a small check. Our average contribution during the last election cycle was $26.76 less than $28 per member. Not fat cats, not big contributors, less than $28 per member. We have a special program called Opportunity Race Program designed to get our members actively involved in candidates on behalf of candidates of their choice. We do this by informing them how these candidates stand on the key issues of the day, importance to realtors and homeowners and private property rights. In the last election cycle in 1994, these opportunity races involved over 22% of our membership, approximately 150,000 members in 66 congressional districts, got these people involved in a political campaigns that they would not have otherwise, in most instances, been involved in had it not been for our PAC and our PAC involvement. Recently, our PAC has shifted substantial amounts of its resources to what we call issues advocacy campaigns and away from direct contributions. What is an issue advocacy campaign? When we have an issue that is a concern to our members, be it at the state, local, or federal level, we spend those dollars raised through the RPAC fundraising mechanism to educate not only our members, but to educate the general public, to educate policymakers on the views. For example, an issue that is uh, now being hotly debated out there in the campaign trails, and that is the overhaul of the nation's tax code and what that might mean in terms of elimination of mortgage interest deduction, state and local property tax deduction, what that could mean to homeowners, the values of, of their house, the, the affordability of housing, the housing opportunities in America. The National RPAC trustees have spent over $350,000 this year on that issue alone. They just recently, last week at their national trustees meeting, uh, voted to spend another $300,000 to carry this campaign forward through the 96 congressional and presidential campaigns. All of this goes to raise voter awareness of key issues. It goes to involve our members politically in campaigns. We have a campaign to get out there to help encourage our members to run for Congress, to run for state legislature, to run for school board, and to get then other realtors involved in helping those people. All of this helps increase citizenship. It helps increase political involvement in this country. And I want to conclude by responding to one question you asked the earlier panel, Mr. Chairman, and that is, if PACs were to go away tomorrow, would we still see that level of involvement? Would we still see that $3.15 million that our PAC raises and collectively spends in election cycle? Would we still see that in the system? The answer is no, because we've tried it. We've tried getting our members involved in, in direct giving, and they simply, we cannot, and we've not been able to get the level of success that we've been able to do to get them to, to write that $25, $26 check to their PAC. So by restricting political action committees, you're going to restrict citizen involvement in this country, and I don't think that's a good thing for the American political system. Thank you very much, Mr. Treason. Mr. Parmalee? Chairman Thomas, Congressman Fazio, good afternoon. My name is Ken Parmalee, and I am the Vice President of the National Rural Letter Carriers Association, an 87,000-member postal union that has maintained a political action committee for a number of years. 
Unfortunately, today, the news media and the public, including our membership, is very critical of PACs because it is perceived that we represent special interests. There is a perception that large individual contributors are cleaner or better than PAC contributions. This, I believe, is a false premise. Individual large contributors have special interests, too. I believe it was the cartoon strip Pogo which said, we have found the enemy and he is us. In fact, virtually every American has some kind of a special interest. And if you take large contributors, they may not be as readily identifiable as money coming from political action committee, and that is because PACs have a principal entity which registers with the clerk of the house and spells out what our legislative interests are. But we at the Rural Letter Carriers believe that our contributors become stakeholders in the election process. In the case of rural letter carriers, the average rural letter carrier earns approximately $36,000 a year. And we live geographically all across the United States except in the major cities. Approximately 12,000 of our members give an average of $23 a year to their PAC. Last year, about 1,000 of them gave as much as $100, and only 12 of them gave over $200. Our PAC is truly a pool of small donations from our members. Rural letter carriers live in about 23,000 zip codes across the United States. That's just about half the zip codes in the country. 8,000 zip codes are represented by contributions to our political action committee. On the other hand, if we take, and I don't have current election figures, but I have them from 1990, the top 10 zip codes in the United States gave 5% of all the individual contributions to members of Congress, and the top 100 zip codes gave 21% of all the contributions, and one Manhattan zip code gave more individual contributions to campaigns than from each of 24 states. So it is our belief that if you want to involve citizens in this process and keep them involved in the process, you will not ban PACs, but keep us around because, as the other witnesses have said, we get our members to participate in the process, and our members live everywhere, and they vote for you all, and they get involved in your campaigns, and uh, that's exactly what we want them to do. We don't think PACs are a problem. The perception of money is a problem. We all recognize that. That was the heart of the 1974 reforms, the perception of money. But then I suspect the perception of money has been a problem since the beginning of the Republic. We uh, at the Rural Letter Carriers like the Speaker's proposal. I have not had a chance to study it in detail, but we think the appointment of a commission of wise men and women to study the problem with a closure that Congress could vote up or down on is a very constructive idea. Um, that concludes my testimony, and I would be glad to offer, answer any questions that you have. And thank you for holding these hearings, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate them very much. Well, thank you, and I thank all the panel for their testimony. General from California, wish to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since this is a, uh, a panel of PAC partisans, let me uh, see if I can ask you to look at some of the issues that might amount to PAC reform within the community of PACs. And I apologize. I didn't hear uh, all of the panel certainly make all of their remarks, but we have in particularly the two groups represented uh, to the left of the audience, very broad-based organizations. We all know, however, there are PACs that don't have mass membership organizations behind them uh, or many contributors. Is there a way that we could, within the structure of reform of PACs, engender more participation more democracy with a small d, if that's a question about how contributions are made. Are there ways we could take some of the rough edges off the PAC attack 
by showing more clearly that these are organizations that represent thousands of people and not a handful of people who have found another way to amplify what is probably already for them uh, a loud voice in the political process by making personal contributions as well. I'd be interested in the thoughts of any of you as it relates to the original purpose of PACS, I think, as it was created uh, in the image of the Clark McGregors of the world, who were looking to come up with an alternative to mass membership labor PACs, bringing white collar workers or corporate middle management and senior management people together in a political process, much like these two organizations certainly have perpetuated. Mr. Fazio, um, the, the, the law as it stands today, in order to become a multi-candidate committee, you have to have 50 people contributing to your organization. So you start with that base. Uh, some expansion on that uh, uh, probably is not a bad idea, at least to look at. Uh, I think it is, however, a myth that there are a lot of PACs out there that only have a small number of people in them uh, that give major amounts of money to the PAC and then in turn to candidates. I, I don't know any of those. Uh, our surveys of the business community, for instance, the corporate community, uh, shows that there's about 800 people uh, on average per corporate PAC and their average contributions are slightly less than $200 a year to the PAC. So there may be a handful of those, but I don't think it's a particular problem. But the idea that you should perhaps reward those that uh, are better at stimulating people and getting them involved in campaigns, not a bad concept. I'm not just sure yet how you might implement that. I think it would have to be broad gradations. Some of the earlier proposals in earlier Congress that talked about fat cat packs, which I don't think there are many of, and skinny cat packs, uh, just weren't based on any evidence. Plus, they, they, they protected certain groups and penalized others. And you get down that road, it's a slippery slope. I hope you'll think more about it, Steve. And if others want to comment on the point you just made of, of ways of emphasizing more participation by structuring the rules a little differently, I'd be happy to hear it. Well, I, I, think, I think in part, um, uh, Congressman Fazio, the problem is one of political education. I think it's, uh, if enough people uh, uh, saw the uh, tape of this, uh, these hearings, they might uh, realize that PACs do represent a, a broad spectrum of American political life, that they are an important vehicle for participation by both the average person and the, the more than average person. And that's, uh, that's their genius in a way. And uh, so I think the, the major problem, assuming that the structure of the law were to ch remain essentially unchanged, is a matter of political education. The one comment that I would share with you, Mr. Fazio, on that is that while by almost I think any standard of a skinny pack or broad levels of participation or low average dollar contribution, the Realtor Political Action Committee would fall within that framework. And so I could sit there and, and be very self-righteous and say, yes, yes, limit uh, those packs and we can go ahead and do our business the way we're doing it now. But prior to going with the National Association of Realtors, I was with another real estate trade association here in town. I also oversaw their pack. They did not by the nature of the, of the membership, have as broad a base. They, they tended to represent companies as opposed to, to individuals. And we had a much higher dollar contribution. We had a much smaller uh, number of people contributing. Uh, we also had a much smaller overall total dollar amount uh, to, in which to give. And, and I think it would be unfair to say that that pack is somehow the other tainted or not uh, uh, not viable because I, I tend, tend to agree with the statement that that participation is the problem of participation is solved by more participation getting more people involved and that does also include people who are able to make and write those thousand dollar or even sometimes multi thousand dollar check to a pack as long as there is full disclosure about uh, which we would as to where those contributions are coming to and who those contributions are going to I think that's the real problem that needs to be addressed and solved by disclosure which is exactly what the pack reform of 74 did. Uh, I think I'll use uh, Mr. Crane as a foil since he's not here. Um, in, in part of his testimony, he indicated uh, what contempt the uh, legislators earlier must have had for the process by virtue of the structure that they created. And, and I was really going to uh, engage him in discussing the fact that notwithstanding the fact that everybody who's been elected has gone through the process doesn't necessarily make them contemptuous. It may, in fact, be that they're ignorant or naive. 
uh, about uh, the consequences of the decisions that they made. And what we tried to remind people in the first hearing was that we had a spurt of laws basically in the early 70s. One court case and then a series of decisions from a commission that was created out of those laws with virtually no changes since then. A lot of stops and starts and um, attempts, but, but no fundamental re-examination. And what we're trying to do uh, at this time, notwithstanding the pressure to, to move product, which uh, uh, many of us believe to be imperfect in a number of ways, is to carry out a more fundamental examination of what went on in the 70s so that we don't create those, as Mr. Stockmar said, unintended consequences. When you began looking at the way in which individual contributions relate to individuals who are part of partnerships, which get counted if they contribute through the partnership back toward the individual contribution, but that if they had made it through a PAC, it doesn't count toward the individual contribution, it creates a, a rather bizarre minefield of when and how and through which structure you contribute. I don't think it was through contempt. I just don't think folks really understood to a very great extent what they were doing. Um, Mr. Driesler, you, you outlined the activity of the Realtors PAC, and I had said earlier that I thought political parties were relatively unique institutions in that they carried on a series of activities that no other institution carried on, and I talked about recruiting candidates for office and making sure those candidates get elected and to program public policy and your outline of your PAC talking about your issues thrust and recruiting candidates and helping to finance them sounds an awful lot like a political party and I was sitting here trying to go over my definition and then I said wait a minute uh, there are several members of Congress who uh, were in fact realtors when they ran for office and several of them have indicated to me, notwithstanding the fact that they were realtors, uh, the realtors did not contribute to their election, and they contributed to their opponents who happened to be incumbents. And I just use that for this segue. I still believe my definition is valid because of that, because I haven't seen too many situations where the Democrats help a Republican get elected or a Republican help a Democrat or any other party structure. Only indirectly. Indirectly. <laughs> and that goes back not to contempt, but ignorance and uh, naivety usually. I have a real concern about the belief that many people think political parties are super PACs or PACs are mini parties. And frankly, I believe that neither is either. Uh, and Mr. Stockmar, when you went through your analysis of what would happen in the system if we uh, followed the wishes of some of our colleagues and did away with PACs and you indicated there would be fewer dollars, there would be more time trying to raise dollars, more reliance on the wealthy, uh, less accountable in terms of the structure, education would suffer. And, and my desire to respond to you at that time was only if you keep the current structure because what you've done is shut down political parties who used to perform all of those functions and that if you released political parties it wouldn't necessarily produce the result that you have and I guess what it does is caution us that if we're going to make a change in one area we had better understand it's going to have an influence in another and then I'll make one more statement and I would invite a reaction if any of you want to Mr. Gara, the appeal is, is always um, fundamentally exciting when someone tells me the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law. And Justice Holmes says, yeah, but you can't shout fire in a crowded theater if there's no fire. And so from that absolute position of the First Amendment, which is sometimes difficult to defend, I don't know that I absolutely support somebody's ability, not necessarily based upon any achievement they occurred in their lifetime other than accident of birth, to be able to go into the political arena and literally blow out anybody else's ability to participate. And, and, and there I'm wrestling with that, that question of yes but, yes but, as we move through it. Now, your point in, um, in Buckley, I think, is more reinforced today about disclosure being the fundamental sunshine in the system because technology allows us to make 
disclosure a real-time part of the campaigns more today than ever before. We just passed bipartisan, uh, with no objection, reform in the statutes to allow the FEC to begin electronic filing. And I think in a short time we'll have a real-time campaign participation on the question of disclosure. But notwithstanding that, I still bump up against uh, Justice Holmes' argument of not being able to shout fire in a crowded theater when there's no fire. I think that's true. The First Amendment uh, is not... Once again, I would ask you to direct the mic. I think you're, you're obviously correct, uh, Mr. Chairman. The First Amendment has not been interpreted as absolutely protecting uh, all utterances written or spoken. Um, on the other hand, where political speech uh, is concerned, uh, the court has given uh, the First Amendment its most stringent application. Uh, and so the words of the First Amendment are a special caution that of the various kinds of laws that threaten First Amendment rights of expression and communication, the ones that we are to be most concerned with are those that emanate from Congress and particularly those that, as I said earlier, uh, form the rules of the political road. Mr. Thomas, uh, if I could comment on your question of what happened in the 70s and about political parties. Uh, I was around when the 74 Act was passed and shortly after it took effect found myself uh, trying to manage the National Republican Congressional Committee campaign arm of House Republicans under the new law. And I found at that time most everybody, uh, least of all incumbents, had no idea of what was in that 74 Act and were astounded when they came to us in the 76 elections and says, where is my big amount of money that I used to get from my campaign committee? I'm sorry, we can't give it to you because the law treats us as no more than a super PAC. And that's, that's unacceptable, I think, to the two-party system in this country, or any number of party system for that matter. The party committees are not special interests. The party committees are there for a broad range of purposes. Obviously, I'm biased on this point, but I think the whole system would be better off if the parties were stronger, were able to do more. I'd take all their limits off, subject them to full disclosure, uh, and, and I think the system would be a lot better off if we did that. I don't think that would stop PACs from trying to do what they can do in their little narrow corners of the world or broad corners, but uh, they should be encouraged as well. But in many ways, the parties have been supplanted by the law. The presidential campaigns are not as vigorous, as vital as they should be. The 74 Act is a failure, and we really ought to examine it and consider taking some of it off, not putting more of it on. Why, why would we take a failed law and apply and do more of it. It's beyond me that we should move in the same directions that the 74 Act is. Thank you. Would I be pushing it if I referred to an article in the Wall Street Journal today uh, entitled The Man Who Ruined Politics, <laughs> 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 which is an article about uh, Fred Wertheimer and Common Cause and their view of uh, a kind of uh, destroy the field to, to save it approach to a campaign financing, perhaps it would. Anyone else want to respond to that general question? Because otherwise I'd go to the PACs and say this. Notwithstanding the uh, statements that you've made, one of the criticisms, which I think has a degree uh, of concern if it's valid, is that the broader argument of what we have here are diverse educational and informational structures that allow us to bring more people into politics and allow for participation in politics through pooled dollars has largely um, not been achieved. And that basically what we have in most PACs are centralized check collecting agencies that are primarily interested in influencing the system vis-a-vis uh, -vis assisting incumbents to remain in office. Um, I put it fairly harshly. Uh, and I guess the way I'd ask you to get into, into it is, have you found that your attempts to educate and inform folk satisfied you in terms of fulfilling the goals that you had about getting them involved in the system, or has it been relatively as frustrating as uh, most other folk trying to get your average person involved? Does the hook of participation either in the professional letter carriers or realtors and the tie to the pack, which is part of their at least workaday world, has that been a lever that you found you could use to get people more interested uh, in the system? The answer to that question, Mr. Chairman, is absolutely yes. And let me just give you examples of the two gentlemen who are sitting here today. We have in your district, Mr. Thomas, uh, 1,581 realtors. Uh, we get 500 plus of those who donate to the pack uh, every year. It's a 31% participation level. In Mr. Fazio's district, 
Uh, he has over 5,500 realtors in his district, uh, 2,300 plus donate to the PAC, over a 43% participation. And the thing that we're... Came out for in-district fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, one of the most... Th the things that we're most proud of of our PAC is that our decision-making is from the ground up. And you gentlemen both know, because you've gone through the process, the National PAC trustees do not ever originate a request. We simply respond to, they re simply respond to, approve, uh, deny, amend, a request that originates back in your home congressional districts in your home state. And so it is their involvement. You've gone to those candidate interviews, uh, you've, they, they look at your voting record and they choose to support you, both of you gentlemen, because you have been right on issues that are important to those realtors back in those home congressional districts and those home states. And they may choose, and in fact in many instances have chosen, that even if a realtor runs, that they not support them, not just because they're a realtor, because more fundamentally we believe that, uh, yes, it's important to get realtors involved, but we think it's important to support those people who believe in private property rights, who believe in home ownership opportunities, who believe in the type of issues that you gentlemen espouse, and to make sure that people like you remain in Congress. If you're there, and if you're not in Congress, to do everything we can to get you there. Our PAC was the fifth largest donor to challengers and open seats during this last election cycle. We habitually run about that level. So we put a lot of our resources into uh, open seats and into challenger seats. Uh, you know, but yes, you know, we do give a lot to incumbents, but individuals give proportionately the same amount to incumbents uh, uh, as, as PACs do because you're dealing with a known quantity uh, and as one uh, person alluded to in the earlier panel, you're dealing with an odds that heretofore have said 98% of you get reelected. Uh, those odds have come down slightly in the last two election cycles, but it's still 90 plus percent, which is a pretty good bet in any horse race. But still, fundamentally, notwithstanding that, we look primarily at issues, at voting records, and what the realtors back home tell us who they want us to support, and that makes the determination. And just briefly, let me say that the point I tried to make about comparing the realtors to political parties was to point out that even if you emulate most of what a political party does, you can't do it because you're not a mutually exclusive operation That's like correct. political parties, and so they are, in fact, unique institutions, and my definition survived even your expanded role for PACs. And, and we, we would support uh, uh, expanded roles for political parties. We have been major donors to political parties uh, in the belief that it's important to have a viable uh, uh, two-party system. Mr. Parmalee, did you want to respond? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, in part, the reason that PACs and individuals, uh, as you so well pointed out before, uh, end up supporting so many incumbents is you develop a voting record. You develop a history with the organization of how you deal with that organization and therefore the organizations tend to um, go more towards incumbents. But in open seats, we encourage our state leadership to interview the candidates and to actually get involved, give them a questionnaire and see where they stand on issues that are vital to us. And we also feel that those people, as we said, who do give money to PAC really become stakeholders and really do care about voting, frankly, more than our other members do. We have over 200,000 of our members who have at some point in time given to the PAC. When we have an issue before Congress, we will typically send out a, a call to action. No doubt you have been recipients of some of those calls and, and letters. We have tracked the amount, the percentage response from those who have given to the PAC versus those who have not. I know some people watching might want to know what in the world is he talking about. <laughs> but I think you folks do, and as we talk about it, people might understand. Uh, the National Association of Realtors uh, a number of years ago, and this is number of times we've been around this racetrack too on campaign finance reform uh, are on record as having favored and called for the abolition of leadership PACs. Uh, our national PAC trustees uh, a couple of years ago said well let's put our money where our mouth is and we have voluntarily suspended giving money to leadership PACs for the very reasons you just uh, so well articulated. The political party issue has been a little bit difficult for us. I will be honest with you there are many within our association who uh, feel 
that uh, if we give to a party, they may in fact give then to candidates that uh, our realtors wouldn't support, in fact may be opposing, and that that, that is somehow a, a not wise use of the money. On the other hand, there are those who feel that uh, parties are important, that they serve a vital interest of, of recruiting candidates, of helping get uh, the message out, getting people involved. And so we have been somewhat mixed. We have reduced our level of party giving, uh, but we have not eliminated it completely, I guess, in an effort to try to strike a balance between those people who feel like we should be giving all of our money either to candidates or to issues or to direct involvement as opposed to the, the horizontal transfer uh, versus still some legitimate uh, and, and valid uh, need to support the major political parties. Uh, let me say that if you were looking at it negative, the argument would be people wouldn't want to move money horizontally because they would lose the influence and the whole purpose of giving money is to influence and why would you give money to somebody else to let them influence when it's your money? I think the positive and legitimate way is accountability. The concern about being able to disclose and, and have disclosure mean something in terms of where the money originated and where it went. Uh, and I do believe and I do agree with the gentleman from California that uh, when individuals or PACs contribute to political parties, there is a way to structure for accountability and for disclosure that would be different from the horizontal movement of money into leadership PACs or other non-institutional structured giving. I want to thank you very much for your uh, participation. We may be back to you. Obviously, we will for ideas, and this may lead to additional hearings, and we very much appreciate your input. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have just heard from representatives of PACs, and I thought it appropriate that in a discussion about PACs, that although it's always valuable to hear about people who represent PACs, that we might ought to also have a panel of those individuals who are actually members of the PACs and are participants in the PAC themselves. And so the third panel will consist of Kevin Kincaid, who is a firefighter from Fairfax County, Virginia and by virtue of his occupation and his choice, a member of the International Association of Firefighters, and I assume they're PAC. Uh, Adrian Balin is an employee of Baltimore Gas and Electric Company. John Cavanaugh is a member of the National Restaurant Association. And Nancy Dietz is a teacher with the Frederick County School System and a member of the National Educational Association PAC. Let's begin with uh, Adrian Balin, and I will tell all of you if you have written a testimony, it will be made a part of the record without objection, and you have five minutes to inform uh, the committee in any way you see fit about political action committees, your role and participation in them. Thank you. Adrian. Chairman Thomas, Ranking Member Fazio. Could I also once again remind you these, these microphones are very unidirectional and uh, we would prefer you speak into them so not only us but uh, the folks who will be watching this can hear you. Respected committee members, my name is Adrian Balin. I'm an employee of Baltimore Gas and Electric Company, BGE. I come before you today as a supporter of political action committees. PACs are important to me as an individual. Our PAC has enabled me to make my contributions count. By recognizing common goals and interests, BGE employees and retirees have banded together to voice our views to legislators, both to our Maryland delegation and on a national scale. As an individual, I would not have supported candidates throughout the U.S. Small political contributions by an individual seem insignificant compared to the cost of a political campaign. By pooling resources, BGE PAC gives me a voice while supporting the political process. Contributing to a PAC is a very personal issue. The welfare of business itself is important to me. A less than favorable business climate jeopardizes my livelihood. In the current economic climate of cost cutting and downsizing, more and more businesses disappear. I want our PAC to support business interests to broaden Maryland's economic base. I've come to look forward to BGE PAC newsletters. Through publications and discussion, PACs have a definite impact on neutralizing voter apathy and informing each member. PAC members tend to get involved. This results in better government. Not all PAC issues conform to party values. My ideals tend to cross party lines. PACs are nonpartisan entities. They allocate funds based on voting record and an individual's view of issues. I feel this gives me the ability to support the best choice for political office. As a PAC, 
We've argued support for a candidate that expressed our collective viewpoint. PACs support the common goals, setting aside the interests of the individuals for the benefit of the many, and that benefits all. Nothing in this world is perfect, but by keeping PACs viable, in a small way we strive to achieve perfection. I implore you to leave me my voice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Kavanaugh, I neglected to mention that the reason you're a member of the National Restaurant Association is because I assume you, owe Kavanaugh, you own Kavanaugh's Esquire Club, uh, Esquire Club right. which is located where? In Madison, Wisconsin. In Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, you want to direct that mic? And if you're going to come here, you might as well get a plug out of it. So. Right. <laughs> got the cheapest national <laughs> rate in the nation, and I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman and Mr. Members of the, con uh, the committee. Thank you for inviting me here today. My name is John Cavanaugh, I'm, and I'm testifying today on behalf of the National Restaurant Association, the leading organization for the U.S. food service industry. Our industry is made up of nearly 740,000 food service units throughout the United States. I own Cavanaugh's Esquire Club in Madison, Wisconsin. We've been in business for nearly 50 years. I grew up working in the restaurant for my father that started in 1947, mm. and I bought, uh, bought the restaurant from him in 1981. And now we're on our third generation, where my son now is 23, is now working for me, and I hope someday that he'll own the restaurant too. Um, Cavanaugh's Esquire Club uh, sometimes uh, is asked questions what kind of business we are. Uh, because of uh, some people think that we're maybe a private club, but uh, the Cavanaugh's Esquire is, is a uh, steak and seafood restaurant that serves lunch and dinner seven days a week. Um, our customers tend to be regulars, everyone from neighborhood uh, residents to employees of a local Oscar Mayer uh, meatpacking plant in our neighborhood, as well as many politicians, uh, state and local, uh, that come to the restaurant to uh, meet and eat. Uh, when we uh, when the phrase campaign finance hits the headlines, people think that political corruption, high state campaign contributions, and big ticket fundraisers are appropriate. They don't think of people like me. And I'm here today because I'd like to put another face on it, one that I think is much truer to life, even if it's not as uh, good for the headlines. I'm a regular contributor to the National Restaurant Association Political Actions Committee, and for the past two years I've served as a PAC trustee, which means I've gotten more involved in both fundraising and deciding where to spend our money. It has, given, or it has given me a real feel for the way a good PAC does business, and I'm proud that we do, that we do it that way. Our PAC is a significant PAC. Last election cycle, restaurant owners contribute over $700,000 to the association's political action committee. Nearly 60% of them contributed less than $100. These are not shadowy figures with deep pockets, but they are people like me, who have literally invested their life's work in their restaurants and who want to come together as an industry to impact on national politics. We can be as different as, as each other as the Esquire Club is from McDonald's, but we share a lot of the same concerns. We believe in strong free enterprise system and getting rid of regulations that don't make sense and keeping our taxes low so that our capital can go back into our businesses. That is why this PAC spends its money extremely diligently. Put simply, we support our supporters and we oppose those who oppose us. Based on recommendations from local restaurateurs, we scout the country early and often for promising challengers, both incumbents and non-incumbents. Last year, 45% of our contributions went to challengers and non-incumbents. That's a higher proportion than the average PAC. In fact, it's a higher portion than the general public contributes to non-incumbents. We did because we, we were dead serious about standing up for an industry that accounts for 9 million jobs and $290 billion in annual sales. I tell you all this because we have nothing to hide at our NRA PAC. It is a clean way of doing business, and like I said, I'm proud of it. I'm no Ross Perot, but I don't, I don't kid myself that a, a donation to my PAC is not going to make or break an election. It makes me part of the democratic process though it is the easiest way for me to participate in the process on the behalf of my industry that is my livelihood. I'm at my restaurant six and a half days a week, usually working 12-hour 12, 12 days. My main goal is to keep my customers happy and keep them coming back to see me. 
but because I know Congress, Congress's decisions in Washington affect the way that I operate my, my restaurant in Madison, Wisconsin, I want to be involved at, this, at the national level too, and the PAC gives me a way to do this. People say that PACs cut the average citizen out of electoral, uh, the electoral process. I'm here to say the exact opposite. Literally thousands of restaurant operators who have been brought to the, the electoral process by the National Restaurant Association Action Committee, as you know, the names as you know, the names of anyone contributing over $200 are available as a matter of public record. We are happy to provide the names of all others, too. I can hardly think of a more open and responsible way to encourage participate in the democratic process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Dietz, um, representing the NEI, I assume you're a teacher? Yes. Uh, what do you teach? I teach math. What level? Seventh grade. Seventh grade. Yeah. Will there be a quiz? <laughs> No, it was less the subject, more the age level, I remember. That's a, the combination of the two must keep you uh, busy. busy. Thank you very much and appreciate your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Thomas and members of the House Oversight Committee. I'm Nancy Deeds, a seventh grade math teacher at West Frederick Middle School in Frederick, Maryland. I have come to speak to you today because I believe that you should maintain my right to participate in the Political Action Committee of the National Education Association. As a teacher, my influence is not great, I do not often get the opportunity to speak with members of Congress, but it's important that you hear my message. That message is that you must see to it that every child in the United States has an opportunity to learn. That opportunity often depends on you. You make decisions that affect schools and teachers and children, and your decisions are a result of a political process that affects us all. How can I take part in that process? How can I join the debate? You do not often hear my voice, but you hear me because I can join with others like me to raise a collective voice in support of education. You hear the message of the NEA. In my community of Frederick County, Maryland, during the last election, over $40,000 was raised in six weeks in support of candidates sympathetic to the interests of builders and other local businesses. to the voters. Guess who won? At the national level, it's those big corporations with great big blue chip names who raise money to pay for advertisements and mailings. They have money, they have a voice, and they are heard. Teachers don't have that kind of money. They have, teachers don't have that kind of money, but isn't it important that we have a voice? Isn't it only fair that my interests be represented in the political process along with those of large corporations? Through my individual comp contributions to my local, state, and national political action committees, I have influence, I am included. Please protect my right to be heard. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. Just let me say briefly, and I'll go to Mr. Kincaid in a minute. Uh, I think it would be uh, um, an amendment that you would accept to your testimony that every time you said corporation, you would say individuals in the corporation, since clearly it's illegal for corporations to participate in federal elections. It was the individuals in the corporation. That was my intent. Right. right. Uh, Mr. Kincaid. Yes, sir. How long have you been a firefighter? Uh, almost 17 years. Thank you. May testify. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Fazio, my name is Kevin Kincaid and I've been an active firefighter and paramedic for almost 17 years. I'm currently a captain with the Fairfax County Fire and Rescue Department. I appear before you today to explain why I participate in FirePAC, the Firefighters Political Action Committee, and to tell you why I believe that PACs are beneficial to the nation's emergency response personnel. The decisions made by the United States Congress have an enormous impact on my life and the lives of all firefighters. Whether the issue is assuring that the protective gear I wear into a fire meets basic safety requirements or assuring that my pension is secure, the votes cast by members of Congress directly impact my ability to do my job and protect the public safety. I believe that I have a right to support candidates for office who support firefighters. Contributing to the firefighters PAC is the way that I do that. All money raised by our PAC comes from voluntary contributions made by the nation's professional firefighters. The typical donation is around $25. 
I view political action committees as a way for the average American to participate in our nation's political process. The unfortunate reality is that wealthy people always have and always will be able to influence elections with their money. PACs are the mechanisms for firefighters and other middle income Americans to attempt to level the playing field. Mr. Chairman, I don't know too many firefighters who are in a position to sit down and write a check for $1,000. In fact, I don't know any firefighters who can do that. Uh, but by pooling the small contributions of firefighters across the country, the Firefighters PAC is able to assist candidates who are willing to stand up for us, and we are able to offset some of the financial advantages of candidates backed by those who oppose us. It's a simple question of fairness. Upper income people can raise $5,000 for a candidate who represents their interests by asking five friends to donate $1,000 each. But to raise $5,000 for a candidate who represents our interests, we must ask at least 200 firefighters to donate $25 each to our PAC. I firmly believe that banning PACs would enable the wealthiest Americans and large corporations to dominate the political process. Candidates who stand up for working Americans would simply not be able to compete. In short, PACs are, are the way that the voices of typical Americans get heard by our nation's policymakers. Large donations, whether from an individual or a PAC, come with an unstated message attached. When the Firefighters PAC contributes to a candidate, it is understood that the support is being provided because the candidate supports firefighter issues. I want my donations to carry a message, and the Firefighters PAC makes that possible. In recent years, there has been a great deal of rhetoric about the detriments of PACs on our political system. I hear these comments on radio and read about them in the newspaper columns, and I even hear them echoed around the fire, sta fire stations. I would like to share my thoughts with you on why I find these arguments misguided. First, some people argue that PAC contributions are little more than bribes. Members of Congress, the argument goes, vote for legislation contrary to the public interest simply because their vote will be rewarded with a campaign contribution. Aside from being insulting to members of Congress, this argument misunderstands the relationship between voting and PAC donations. Members of Congress do not support firefighter issues because they receive support from the firefighters PAC. Members of Congress receive support from us because they support firefighter issues. It will, become, it will come as no surprise to the members of this committee that the Firefighters PAC has been a strong supporter of Representative Kurt Weldon, Mr. Fire Service in the U.S. Congress. But our, fire, our support did not influence his views of firefighters. Kurt Weldon was a champion of firefighters long before coming to Congress. The only thing that the Firefighters PAC contributions did was help this champion of firefighters win a seat in Congress. A second argument used against PACs is that they comp comprise some sort of secret cabal, a mysterious group of people meeting behind closed doors to manipulate the political process for their own selfish needs. In reality, PACs are the most open and heavily regulated entities in existence. Every PAC donation expenditure is reported to the Federal Election Commission and available for public review. The methods PACs use to raise money are restricted by federal law and closely regulated. I find it significant that despite the negative perception of PACs, campaign finance scandals in recent years almost never involve PACs. The Keating Five controversy, for example, dealt with contributions from individuals. The truth is PACs are the cleanest, most accountable, and most open aspect of campaign finance ever developed, and banning PACs would surely make campaign finance less ethical than it is today. Finally, the argument has been made that PACs are detrimental because they advance special interests. Mr. Chairman, allow me to tell you a few things about my job. Firefighting is the nation's most dangerous profession. Every day, firefighters put their own lives on the line to protect the lives and property of our fellow Americans. We are a very special group of people, and we have legitimate legislative interests. And if that makes me a special interest, then so be it. I'm glad that there is a PAC out there that supports me and one that I can support with my voluntary contributions. I don't doubt that there are problems with the way that the campaigns in this country are financed. It seems to me that too much money is spent campaigning, and there may be a way to reduce the overall influence of money on the political process. But whatever problems exist, PACs are not one of them. As this committee considers this issue, I leave you with a plea on behalf of myself and my fellow firefighters. Please don't take away our ability to participate in the political process, and please don't destroy my political action committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all of you uh, addressed the question of your desire and, in fact, involvement in pooling your funds for some kind of a combined impact through your PAC. 
Uh, can any of you give me any uh, instances, uh, either uh, because of your ability to contribute some time or your inclination to be involved in any kind of educational or informational activities surrounding uh, the PAC, or have you only been able to limit your participation to dollars and cents in the PAC? You mean in terms of educating the public about issues? If you have a PAC and you're a part of that PAC, your testimony primarily focused on the contributions that are important to you through that PAC. Have any of you been able to contribute time or have you been involved in any kind of educational or informational activities focused by your PAC or initiated by your political action committee to assist in more than just putting dollars into the political system? Our, um, I, on a local level, uh, if, during the last election, I organized the volunteers through my PAC um, to uh, drop literature, to make phone calls. We um, developed a list of candidates um, to deliver at, at polls that supported uh, educational issues. Is that what you mean? Did you get people involved that hadn't been involved in the political process before? Oh, yes. Teachers, you mean? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, Were they contributors to the PAC prior to being involved? I can't answer that for sure it's my uh, it's my sense that they were that not all of them were because our um, our contributions were lower the year before we um, we had a lot more participation mostly it was because of the leadership the people who were directing what was going on and and because we had the pack drive we had we also had a lot of other activities that um, so it's your impression after the participation that there's a higher participation in the political giving through the PAC than before? It's, I, I guess the PAC um, drive is one thing, one way we go to all our members and say you can, you can contribute this way. Some of them choose not to. Some of them contribute time as a result of that request. Some of them say, no, I'd rather not give uh, money, but uh, I, would I would make phone calls. I, you know, so, sure. so yes, it does stimulate that kind of activity, and that's what we look for. Okay. Anybody else react at all? Uh, the firefighters make a great deal of effort on a local and a national level to educate all our members on political education. And uh, we hold legislative conferences and, and uh, different arenas to, to bring our members in, to bring new members in, to educate them in the political process and, and the firefighters' needs. Yeah, Mr. Kevin, in Wisconsin, I belong also to the Wisconsin Restaurant Association, and, and in a lot of states nationally now, the, the National Restaurant Association is taking affiliations of the state associations to become one, one unit. Mm -hmm. um, and Wisconsin is one of the last states to kind of join as, as, as a member of both automatically. But in Wisconsin, uh, all our monthly meetings, and we have 17 chapters around the state, um, all, we have uh, political um, forums, and we bring in candidates, whether it be national or local candidates, to uh, bring up issues. And we do uh, mailings out of, of political questions uh, that, that bring all the, all the members, which in Wisconsin is 6,000 members, to the, to the state association, so that they're aware of all the political things that are happening. So they are becoming more politically active, and I think that's really what the, the general tone is that what you want them is you don't want just the money, you want their vote and their support. I think any mm -hmm. political action committee that puts out any literature automatically starts discussions amongst coworkers, friends, family, <laughs> Because there are issues that come out, there are interesting articles that come up, things that are just warrant discussion. And I think this tends to get people more involved and just starts to spread involvement at a grassroots level. Uh, Mr. Fazio? Mr. Chairman, if you would permit me, given the fact that we've just had a bell ring for a vote in the House, I have three questions. I'm going to just read them slowly, and I'd be interested in your uh, responding to any of them that move you. First of all, how do you feel about the process of selecting the candidates you contribute to? Do you feel you're involved? Do you feel you have input? You know, what do you do to solicit the grassroots of your pack, in other words, to be involved in the process of actually deciding who you're going to support? How do you sell your, and let's just stipulate to this, increasingly cynical colleagues about the value of participating when, in fact, with corporate downsizing and everything else that's happening in the society, 
teachers being laid off, firemen being laid off, restaurants going belly up. People are increasingly reluctant to give, giving the impression that they have little hope that it'll mean anything. And lastly, how do you feel about a law that would limit your giving simply to your own congressman, one congressman, not your state delegation perhaps, certainly not anyone beyond the boundaries of your state. How do you feel personally, given your current political participation, about a law that would restrict your reach to your own district or your own state in terms of your political participation? I'd be happy to hear from any of you on one or more subjects. Mr. Fauci, I'm very concerned about the last question, just restricting your contribution to an individual that was within your district or within your state. And it's just the fact that we're so diverse as a country. Things that happen on, in California affect Maryland. Things that happen in the north of the country affect the south of the country. I don't think we can limit ourselves any longer to that narrow field. I think we have to realize that what happens in Congress what happens in the U.S. affects all of us. I think we have to be national in scope. Uh, one of the things that the process where, uh, where we uh, look at candidates, uh, uh, the candidates are interviewed by uh, the political action committee and uh, we keep a, a real detailed um, voting record on how they vote on our issues. And at the uh, PAC trustee committee meetings, uh, each candidate is discussed um, on, on his voting record, and uh, the candidates are, are um, if, if there is a political uh, contribution that, that's considered for them, uh, people in their district uh, certainly have the, the major um, input on to whether they're going to receive funding or not. It's not, uh, not just at, uh, at, a, at a national level. At the level of the local person is really important on whether they uh, um, should be considered for funding. So I think that's important. Um, on the issue of the process, um, in my county, uh, we, the political action interview team interviews all the candidates and then um, makes a recommendation and the uh, positions of each of the candidates are printed and, and disseminated throughout the membership and then there's a number, every member vote. Um, it's a little different depending on which level of, of race um, it, it concerns. Uh, but, but every member is given the information on all the candidates and often that's the only time that they get um, information on all the candidates in one um, publication. You, you know your local candidates better, perhaps, but do you feel that uh, you've had some say in the selection of state and federal candidates through people who represent you? Well, I think, I think it's, it's natural for, for you to be more informed the closer it is to home, and I feel that that's true. But I've also had um, I've also been able to enter into the deb debate on state candidates and we send a representative to uh, the committee that um, endorses or chooses or makes a recommendation on the congressional race as well. And then that comes back to the county for, um, for an endorsement or not. So, so that it's, you know, and the districts cross across different counties. So it's a shared responsibility. Yes. Um, on the other issue of how do you get people to buy into that process, ask them. And, and I, I find a lot of hope out there. I don't think that people are hopeless and depressed about the, about the system. I go up to them and ask them, would you like to donate to PAC? And most of them just say yes, depending on how much homework we've done and uh, gotten a, a lot of information out and how the political process is affecting them. Um, they're, they're willing to donate. It's not difficult to get people to buy in. You just have to tell them how and you have to ask them. Kevin, your thoughts on that last point? Uh, I think the firefighters, we, we've seen over, over time that uh, collectively we are much stronger and that our voice is uh, much louder and we can get our issues heard. Uh, and, and our members are, see that very clearly now. Uh, we have a, a process also where we screen all, all our uh, candidates locally and, and uh, on the different levels and uh, everybody has an opportunity to participate in that, everybody that would like to. Um, they're all screened on firefighter issues. We steer clear of uh, 
uh, of issues that are not firefighter issues. Um, uh, it, it's kept to be in a, a very open process for us. It, as far as uh, supporting candidates outside of our of our own district, uh, firefighter issues are nationwide. They're they're all over, and and our issues, as long as our issues are nationwide, and as long as our issues uh, affect firefighters all over, um, we would you know always want the opportunity to uh, to assist anywhere where we can have somebody assist firefighter issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Follow on to Mr. Fazio's question. If you've ever been involved in the attempt to uh, determine which candidate should receive a contribution from your political action committee, have you ever been involved in the process and the candidate that you wanted to receive the money didn't? And what was your reaction to that? I was disappointed. <laughs> um, but it happens. I mean, people are elected that I don't choose. I, I lose elections. I mean, I, I don't always get my way, but I feel like if I've been able to come to the table and say my piece and I've had an opportunity to uh, be included in the process, I'm comfortable with that decision. If I feel that it's broad-based and, and based on the wishes of the members in my um, association, I'm comfortable with that loss. So you're comfortable if the decision is from the grassroots up in a kind of a triangular structure and uh, what would your reaction be if you thought it was a decision from the top, notwithstanding the structure of the political action committee? That is, if a lot of people wanted them, but the leadership didn't, and it was always uh, a decision of a very small group at the top, would you tend to participate in that kind of a structure? In no. other words, we want your money, but not your opinion. I, I, um, that's not the way my experience is, so I, I probably wouldn't participate in that, but, but that's not my experience. My assumption then is that since you're all involved in participating, giving money in your time, that you believe that what you're involved in is a useful process. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the uh, committee for uh, giving up of your very busy days and the time that you have to do to help us in trying to shape perhaps some uh, new rules and regulations uh, in candidates running for office. Thank you very much. Committee stands adjourned. No, it's just that I'm the only That's it, it's great. House passed a bill which would put stricter limits on gifts members and congressional staff could receive from lobbyists. cover, call the C-SPAN events line. Our telephone number is area code 202-626-